also for this opportunity to present uh, my work uh, that my lab uh, and all our collaborators have done in the past uh, several years. Uh, and also I'm going to lay out a vision which I actually um, wrote about last year in a book that was published uh, by scientists from uh, uh, GKVK, the University of Agricultural Sciences here in uh, uh, Bengaluru. So I'm going to present some of that work from there. And then of course, uh, we'll have some question and answer session at the end. Yeah. So I'll switch to a presentation. So uh, Sharon, I don't know whether you're still sharing the screen if you are. Uh, no, sir, I, I stopped, I stopped. Oh yeah, I stopped, great. So I'll take over, just a minute. Uh, so, as I begin, can people quickly send responses by uh, chat messages in uh, Zoom, if you're joining by Zoom, or by uh, other messages which uh, Sharon and Sohail and others can compile and put them in the Zoom chat so that I can see them easily um, about what you do. So, I just want to have a quick uh, look at who are the, uh, who's the audience right now, so that I can perhaps make a few points according to uh, who our audience is so that it's more relevant to them. I've given this uh, talk to a whole bunch of places from Natural History Museum London to the museum uh, in University of Tokyo to uh, several places, several museums as well as universities in the US and India. But I would like to make it more accessible for this audience. So if you just quickly in one word or two words say who you are, amateur butterfly watcher, university professor, PhD student, master's student, whatever uh, you are, just quickly send uh, a message in the text, in the chat here, so that I can quickly understand uh, who the audience is. Okay, um, I assume that some people are putting some responses. Karan, can you please compile this uh, from uh, YouTube and wherever else? Yeah, sure, sir. Sure. Yeah? Sure, I okay. So that I'll have a quick look. Yeah. No comments as of now on Facebook. Facebook, yeah, we have been lost okay. on All right. chat. Fine, I'll just start then. Uh, Okay, can everyone see my presentation? Yes, sir, we can. Great, all right. So I'll start with that. Um, good evening, it's really wonderful to talk about this particular uh, theme. I've done three or four talks earlier, but this is more of a scientific thing. I do expect that several PhD students and uh, uh, working professionals have joined this. Um, uh, apparently, some uh, folks from JDS I might have also joined. So I'm going to keep it broad. I will try to be accommodating as much as possible, but I do want to cover quite a lot of material. And if you have any questions, of course, keep them for the last. Uh, or if there's something very critical, then of course, you can uh, stop me and ask, but otherwise, uh, keep it for the last. Okay, so um, uh, this is a slightly different title than what I've used, but I'll actually go with this. 
and uh, this is uh, also a presentation that i've given at jagesh and other places with some more additional material uh, from this year some of the papers as well as some of the discoveries that we have made this year are added here so this is sort of an update on uh, uh, all my thinking uh, over the last 25 30 years which has gone into the research program that my lab has built as well as all the collaborations through board of lab of india website or other programs like this big bird of fly month uh, and the national bird uh, bird of fly campaign poll and other initiatives that we have undertaken have done apart from facebook of course uh, the group that we run so i'll start out by pointing and this is this uh, so sir uh, your voice is breaking my voice is breaking even now yeah now it's perfect okay you can just yeah. all right fine so i'll point out that india uh, has a has an incredibly rich natural heritage we have uh, a lot of species more than 1 lakh uh, uh, that we know of right now and i'm pretty sure there will be many 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 more species probably two or three or four times more species than what are described from india uh, so far uh, there was a zsi report many years ago uh in which these numbers were given and if you want uh, i can put those numbers up at some point but uh these this is the known diversity and only a fraction of this diversity is mentioned uh, is shown here uh starting from fungi and plants to animals and uh, all sorts of organisms that i haven't even shown here for example bacteria and viruses and we have tremendous diversity there as well of course as most researchers and uh, uh Uh, non-specialists uh, regular citizens as well we are of course more familiar more taken by colorful uh, organisms like some of those shown here but do understand that the diversity that, that we have goes beyond uh, colors and beyond uh, more fascinating species that we know and some of the things that i'm going to present later on will uh, uh, depend on this understanding that there's a lot that we need to study not necessarily all charismatic which uh, contributes to india's great biodiversity and of course the conservation uh, action that we need to take to protect all this biodiversity so if you want to do that how do we start we really need a very strong a very good um uh, scientific understanding and a scientific framework a research framework on which we should base all our scientific uh, understanding for sure but also conservation action conservation action really is misguided if it is not based on sound observations of nature sound understanding of how nature works how biodiversity is distributed and how to define species before we actually even talk about species conservation if you're not about sure about what species are then what can you conserve so we really need sound scientific understanding before we um, move on to other things like conservation like education um and some of the material that i'm going to present in today's talk is uh, from can you see my cursor here at the bottom so we can't see your cursor you can't see my cursor okay fine so i've given the citation uh, to, at the bottom can you yeah. see that could yeah, it all 2019 yeah we can so see that that is a book chapter that was published last year and the material i'm presenting is uh, some of the material that i'm presenting is from that uh, that book chapter this book was published uh, as a celebration of the life and work of uh, professor viraktamat who uh, is a senior taxonomist one of the best in india who has published more than 500 species of insects tremendous uh, lifetime of work and uh, surely one of the um, uh, one of the inspirations for uh, indian entomologists as well as taxonomists in general so this book was published uh, uh, to honor his uh, work and life and this uh, material is from that so uh, what is shown on this particular slide is india's place in the uh, uh, south and southeast asian by geography so in india uh, you are probably familiar of this fact that we have four uh, known bio, uh, bio uh, diversity hotspots the western ghats sri lanka one is uh, of course the most familiar one for 
south indians and i really strongly believe that western ghats and sri lanka should be two separate biodiversity hotspots rather than just one and then of course we have the himalaya to the uh, north we have indo myanmar uh, which covers part of the uh, uh, northeast india the meghalaya uh, area as well as the patkai hills the uh, nagaland manipur uh, mizoram tripura area and of course the andaman islands are also part of that uh, the dotted uh, purple lines Uh, magenta lines delineate each uh, biodiversity hotspots hotspot and of course the nicobar islands are part of sundarland uh, they're just the northwestern most uh, end of this so apart from the western ghats and himalaya the other two are just the western tips of the uh, biodiversity hotspots but understand that all these four biodiversity hotspots are part of one of the densest clusters of um, um of biodiversity hotspots in the world and this is more than 13 biodiversity hotspots in all i haven't even shown uh, south chinese ones but uh, whatever diversity we have is part of the larger biodiversity and endemism that you see in uh, asian uh, mainland as well as the tremendous fragmentation of the land that has occurred in this uh, uh, uh what we call indo uh, Uh, indo um uh, australian region so wallacea east melanesian islands sundaland which includes part of malaysia and indonesia uh, and of course papua new guinea these are all part of uh, this very large very uh, fascinating biogeographic landscape and everything that we see our endemics our fauna has largely come from this landscape east of india yeah so india certainly has a lot of endemics india certainly has tremendous diversity of all sorts of organisms not just butterflies but all of this fauna is part of the influence biogeographic influences from uh, everything from south china all the way to uh, northern australian region including uh, papua new guinea and uh, of course sundaland so a lot of things that i'm going to talk about especially regarding taxonomy and species are based on this modern understanding that biogeography is really important and species definitions and understanding that we have gained from evolutionary biology in the last few decades is important in understanding uh, both the diversity and endemism of our fauna and flora so uh, with that i'll start india is a land of habitat islands we see india as a very large landmass a cohesive landmass but if you really look india is uh, as a subcontinent is really a highly fragmented uh, uh, set of islands habitat islands i will call them we have uh, mountains like himalaya for example and western ghats and eastern ghats and vindhya and satpura hills which have fragmented landscape it, it has caused elevational gradients uh, as well as latitudinal and longitudinal uh, gradients uh, several really large and impressive rivers like brahmaputra and ganga and even smaller ones like um, uh narmada for example have acted as barriers to movement of organisms and that those barriers have led to uh diversification of almost every group including butterflies into uh, the indian subcontinent and of course we have oceanic islands andaman and Ilo- and nicobar islands and sri lanka is really important for uh, butterfly diversity and endemism as well and these biogeographic barriers have contributed to significant isolation and diversification with endemism anywhere between 5 to 8% for some mobile groups like butterflies and birds to up to 70 80% for some other groups like frogs and odonets which are not as uh, agile meaning they don't move around as much as let's say birds and butterflies can now as you know odonets dragonflies and damselflies are very powerful flyers but they're still restricted to uh, fresh water streams and lakes which restricts their movement in many ways and that has led to tremendous uh, endemism in the indian subcontinent for these groups so uh, these are some of the factors which have uh, contributed to tremendous diversity and especially endemism in the indian region wonderful thanks for pointing out uh, otherwise you will not be able to read the text on these slides so okay so uh, using this background of understanding of what uh, biogeographic setting in which indian biodiversity has flourished as well as uh, what we need to do to understand uh, uh, the distribution of biodiversity 
as well as more advanced aspects of what are species, what are subspecies, what are the clients uh, at which you see all this species diversity distributed and what does that mean for uh, variation by which a lot of uh, taxonomic work is done, for example, uh, those issues will become clear on the background of what the biodiversity hotspots are in India, what the biogeographic bricks are uh, to species movement and what that does to uh, isolation and diversification. So with that background, what I will do is I will uh, review some material about exploring and documenting butterfly fauna. I will talk about understanding the biology of species so that we can uh, make progress beyond just knowing what species we're talking about. And of course, biology of species, understanding of it also helps us uh, define what species are. And of course, in cases where defining one species is difficult, at least we understand why it is impossible to come to a firm conclusion which everybody will agree on. So of course, there's going to be some gray zone because species are evolving and uh, populations may be at a phase where you cannot really uh, draw a line. So using those uh, concepts, I'm going to uh, elucidate a few points. And then of course, uh, we will talk about what education and citizen science can do at the end, perhaps just for a few minutes, because I've talked about this earlier. So I'll start with history of uh, butterfly species discovery in India. This is again um, from the book chapter. Uh, sorry, I forgot to uh, change one. Um, I think it will come at the end, the uh, uh, citation of that. It's not Kunte at all, 2019 in progress anymore. So uh, this is a figure uh, which I put together uh, year before last for this book chapter that I mentioned. And it starts from 1750. Uh, the thing on top in blue is the timeline of uh, species discovery in India. And what you see here uh, in blue is 1750 to 2020. So 1750 is marked because that was the year in which uh, Carl Linnaeus started his uh, Systema Naturae, which was a very influential uh, uh, series of books, which he published in which he laid down the foundation for binomial classification, uh, by which all uh, scientific names are, uh, all species are classified using two names, genus and species. And now of course for birds, butterflies, and many other organisms, we use trinomial name, meaning genus, species, and subspecies. And I'll get to that. But Linnaeus was the one who laid down the foundation for uh, uh, naming of species, the scientific convention for naming of species. So I'm gonna start from 1750. And of course, uh, latest 2020 is what we are looking at. So on top, uh, above that blue uh, uh, belt, the timeline, are some of the biggest names in butterfly taxonomy and the period marked in gray. Uh, so these are some of the biggest names who have uh, either described dozens upon dozens of species slash subspecies, or they have uh, uh, done some major taxonomic works irrespective of species and uh, species descriptions as well which has resulted in the current understanding of butterfly diversity. And below that timeline are uh, marked several landmarks in the uh, history of taxonomy and species discovery in India uh, for butterflies. And of course, I've marked uh, the blue, uh, the green ones are the uh, major books uh, and other things, other resources that have been developed. And the ones in blue are the societies or institutional landmarks. So for example, Asiatic Society of Bengal, which published a very influential uh, uh, journal in which many of the species were published from uh, mid 1800s. For example, was published in, uh, oh, actually uh, in the later part of uh, uh, the 18th century. So uh, that was started in the 1780s. Bombay National History Society was started uh, in the 1880s. And then Forest Research Institute, Zoological Survey of India. These uh, institutions were started in early 1900s. And of course, I've listed the insidious uh, research collections here because of the reasons that I'll explain uh, coming up. And then again, in green, uh, you see the identification of Indian butterflies, which is, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, which is 
which is here. Now, can you see my cursor? Yes, sir. Now we can. Yeah. So here, the identification of Indian butterfly, second edition, Evans's book, which has been extremely influential, it's shown, and that has certainly had a very long um, uh, impact in uh, growth of uh, butterfly taxonomy, and also a lot of baggage, unfortunately, that has been carried forward. And I'll talk uh, a little bit about that. Uh, in the next few slides. And then of course, you, you see taxonomic uh, revisions and monographs uh, and catalogs by uh, Akari and Balint and Cantley, Chiba, Elliot, lots of big names, starting from 1950s onwards. And this is continuing, uh, which is why I've said 1950s onward. And then of course, Evans is, I mean, Winter Blight's book on butterflies over the Indian region, which was the first book which gave detailed uh, natural history of butterflies and not just their description or not just their names. So for that reason, that was a landmark uh, uh, work. And of course, a lot of other things are mentioned. Uh, you can look at the book chapter to see the details of this. But I'll mention one really critical uh, landmark, which is uh, this one here, DNA-based taxonomy and molecular systematics. That started in the late 1990s with very preliminary uh, molecular tools but now we are at a much more advanced stage and this particular uh, aspect of taxonomy has got to a stage where uh, uh, it is actually, it has taken over in importance all the other kind of work that may be done. So this is gonna have really important, uh, um, really important uh, implications for how butterfly biology is done in the future, butterfly taxonomy and systematics are done in the future and what species and subspecies are delineated using what sort of evidence. So I marked that. And um, uh, of course I've marked Indian Foundation for Butterflies, Butterflies of India website, which is compiling a lot of this information and the molecular as well as other taxonomic work that we are doing. And with this talk and a lot of other work that we are doing and a lot of collaborations that we are uh, starting, potentially even with some of the audience members here, I hope that this will uh, grow much uh, further in India and not just be restricted to two or three labs in uh, India, which is unfortunately what's happening right now. But we really need a much more massive um, uh, campaign really to expand uh, the, the scientific works on Indian butterflies, given that it's such an important group of organisms, which can tell us a lot about diversification of Indian uh, biodiversity. So if you look at uh, uh, what happened uh, through this, uh, through this timeline, again, this is the timeline. You will see some of these names. Linnaeus, of course, was the first one. His student Fabricius uh, described a lot of species from India. And then Felder, Horsfield, Kohler, uh, Westwood, Doubleday. These are some of the names that you may be familiar with. Evans, of course, you're familiar. Titler did amazing work from Northeast India and Bell did a lot of work on early stages. And this is a snapshot of uh, uh, work that some of these people did in numbers. So on the y-axis here, you see uh, some of the top contributors to butterfly species discovered in India. And on the x-axis, you have number of taxa described by author. And I say taxa rather than species because these taxa include many subspecies as well. As you know, in India, we have more than 1,400 uh, butterfly species and more than 1,800 uh, subspecies. I'll uh, give you the exact subspecies number. I'll have to look that up. But we have uh, nearly um, more than 1,400 species, which is more than what people have uh, counted so far. And that's because of very poor taxonomic understanding by these uh, authors of what species are and what need to be carried forward from old books versus what needs to be evaluated from already available evidence. And of course, modern understanding of evolutionary biology, systematics, taxonomy, and uh, uh, nomenclature, of course. So uh, what you see is that Moore uh, was the highest contributor. He uh, described more than 500 taxa. And again, by that, I mean species and subspecies. Many of the taxa he described uh, were uh, subspecies when he described them but eventually they have been treated as subspecies. So it includes all those. So this is the taxonomically valid names in other, way, uh, in other uh, uh, words. That is one way of looking at taxa. 
and then you see Yurts and Denisville, uh, Fabricius, they all contributed more than 100 species description and Evans, of course, less than 100, but still a pretty good uh, um, contribution. And that has gone on uh, uh, now to uh, ones and twos, but the species are still being discovered. You know of uh, the species of Calarabia, the Argus that Purnendu discovered, or uh, the bandit tit that I described in 2015, and of course, several more that, uh, for example, ZSI scientists have described, and many more that I'm pretty sure will be described in the next few years. So uh, this discovery is ongoing. Science doesn't stop, unlike what many uh, Indians believe. Old work is not necessarily the best or the uh, most um, uh, standard. And because science uh, updates with modern growth in both thinking as well as data, we need to update uh, all of our understanding with it. Uh, so this is again history uh, illustrated in a different way. This is again 1750 to 2020. And you will see that there was a major spike in uh, uh, the 1950s, late 1950s with uh, Linnaeus's first book. And that's the spike that you see here. And then uh, in the uh, mid 1850s, uh, not 1850s, mid 1800s, there was this huge spike in uh, species or taxon discovery. And after that, there have been a few spikes. These are some of uh, um, uh, Evans's descriptions and other ones are done in uh, several other books. The late 1920s and then 30s and then uh, around these 1940s, 50s are some of the bumps contributed by Evans. But after that, uh, after Evans's death in uh, 1950s, most of the other work that has been published are people like Cantley and uh, uh, Elliot and others, uh, several uh, scientists, taxonomists from Natural History Museum London who have contributed some of these species. And of course, ones and twos have uh, gone on until uh, uh, last year or so. And this is uh, the species discovery that I was talking about. Uh, so I'm going to go to a more uh, critical issue, uh, which honestly has been bothering me a lot, mostly because I just can't believe how resistant Indians are to change and to accepting that the world has moved on from uh, early 1900s where most Indians still are in terms of their understanding of taxonomy and evolution biology as well as systematics. So I use butterflies as a representative group, not as what other people use it as, uh, or rather in addition to that, I also use it as a, a fairly sorry state of understanding and scientific growth that we are in. And that is something I would really like to uh, uh, encourage all of us to change because we do need to move on. If you look at what other scientists are publishing from elsewhere, Indian science is Indian taxonomy particularly is really in shambles. And that is something that has started to change, for example, in reptiles and amphibians and several other groups. And of course, a lot of Indian uh, insect groups as well, but not unfortunately in butterflies. And that really has to change. And unfortunately, some of the older people who have been this is a serious problem. That oh, sir, understand. we can't hear you, so your voice is low. Okay. Uh, yeah, now it's good. Is it better now? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to emphasize this, this with a few examples. Uh, so I will use butterflies as a representative group to highlight some of the problems that we have not uh, butterflies as a flagship group in other ways. So the taxonomy is outdated in several ways. Uh, uh, not that all of uh, it is outdated, but some critical aspects of it are, are outdated. And there is a very uh, a broad misunderstanding of what species and subspecies are and how they're defined actually, not just what they are in terms of the names that we know, but what it means in evolutionary terms, in taxonomic terms, in systematic terms. What does it mean to have a genus? What does it mean to be a species and subspecies versus population and so on? And again, so a lot of this was reviewed with a lot of references in the book chapter that I've uh, mentioned earlier and which I will cite in the next few slides as well. But that is something that we really need to uh, do. 
as I mentioned, the Indian region is a complex biogeographic uh, region where we need to uh, put all our understanding of taxonomy in this light of modern biogeography, as well as evolutionary biology and systematics. So that's something that we need to do. We need to understand exactly what uh, people mean by species and subspecies and synonyms and clients and uh, uh, variations and uh, synonyms. So these are things that we really need to understand. Again, a lot of information has been given in uh, the book chapter, and I will deal with some of these ideas in the presentation uh, today. Knowledge of current distributions and populations was virtually absent until recently. Everything people knew was from whatever was given in really old books. And then of course, random observations by individuals everywhere else. But there really wasn't any uh, particular compilation, there was no way for people to start uh, putting together information, uh, an area, a vacuum, which Butterflies of India website has started to fill. And we actually have really good uh, uh, distributional maps for Indian butterflies now, thanks to this, uh, to, to this website, to which I'm pretty sure a lot of you, if not every single one of you, has contributed. So this is really, uh, Sharon, you mentioned that this website was developed and known by me. That is not the correct description. I wanted to actually point that out right away, but I knew there would be opportunities. So it's certainly created by me and I'm one of the uh, chief editors of the website, but it is really owned by everybody who has contributed because the images are contributed by them. And just for copyright purposes, for legal purposes, we have uh, insidious holding the copyright, but it's really not owned by any one person or uh, any one agency. It's really a group effort, a, really a national uh, resource that every butterfly watcher should ideally own, uh, both in their minds as something that they've contributed, as well as something that they should contribute to and use. And I know everybody uses, some people don't perhaps uh, uh, use it as much or cite it as much, but certainly everybody has used it at some point or another. Uh, the most, um, problematic thing for Indian uh, butterfly taxonomy and biology is that there are no major programs in modern entomology and biology of insects, a situation that is worse for butterflies and moths. Generally, on the whole, in the world, um, what you can see is taxonomy has been uh, retreating in the scientific fields. It used to be a very important field, but slowly it has become less important in the whole uh, uh, landscape of scientific studies. Uh, in terms of prestige, but it is really still a critical central piece for a lot of evolutionary studies, taxonomic studies, systematic studies, uh, the whole thing from nomenclature to morphological taxonomy and everything else. So this is something that we need to establish and I'll mention what we have done uh, through NCBS and my lab, but that's also something that we need to expand uh, at a national level. And this is something that we all need to work together for. Um, so the reference for uh, Indian butterflies for, for many years has been Evans's 1930 book. Several uh, people still cite that book as the uh, God's word, which is really not the case. And now more recently, for example, Varshney and uh, Smetachik edited book is something that people have used, but they have largely copied this from a lot of uh, random sources, not necessarily by uh, looking at original evidence as well as uh, original uh, scientific papers, both species descriptions as well as uh, taxonomic revisions. And that is quite evident from the number of references that they have cited. For example, the book chapter I mentioned has more references cited than that entire uh, butterfly fauna that they put together. It's a good effort. It is much better than what Evans had, for example, but Evans at least had a key. This is not even that, and this has to change. For a butterfly fauna like ours, this is just not good enough. So um, we need a major, major, major upgrade to our taxonomic understanding. And the first step to that is good compilation of all the available information. But Evans's book, I've put this up still because that is still considered uh, uh, the most important taxonomic reference. And many people still use species and genus assignments from that book for uh, butterflies even now, which is just crazy. If you send your papers to any international journals, they're just gonna ask you to change those because 
the rest of the world has moved on, even if Indian uh, butterfly watchers haven't moved on. And the problem with uh, that book and a lot of work that has been done subsequently, including many of the recently published papers and books and monographs or whatever you want to call them, is that uh, the subspecies concept was at an infancy when Evans wrote this book. And even if Evans did a lot of great work, he was not really trained in taxonomy very well. And he didn't, there's no evidence that he consulted other taxonomists. In fact, there's evidence that other people have written that some of his ideas were a little bit off, uh, even for his time, when uh, in academia, the understanding of species and subspecies was refining, mainly through a lot of influential work by Dobjansky and later Ernst Meyer, who was a professor at uh, Howard, and he wrote a lot about uh, animal taxonomy, which really uh, made Con species concepts and subspecies ideas popular around that time. And also it brought a, a scientific understanding of what those concepts are. So those things um, uh, were uh, done around that time uh, the book came out, but unfortunately Evans had not caught up with those changes. And his book unfortunately reflects that. Sympatry, allopatry and species status is all confused. If you don't know what sympatry is, sympatry is when two or more species occur together in one area at the same time. And allopatry, allo is different, sim is similar uh, or same and uh, uh, or shared. It has various meanings. Um, and allo is different as I mentioned. So allopatry is when two uh, or more species or populations occur in different areas. So typically taxonomists treat something, uh, any two uh, taxa which occur together as typically species because um, uh, if two species occur together and they still maintain their species identities or their morphological identities and genetic identities, then of course those have to be species. If the populations are allopatric, then whether you treat it as species or subspecies is uh, a little bit uh, tricky because you need to have enough um, uh, traits by which you can define those species or you need to know something which is so striking that you cannot bring yourself to call them two species or two subspecies based on the evidence. But generally you want to see multiple lines of uh, separation between what you're going to treat as species. And again, this was something that Evans was very foggy about. He treated a lot of um, good species as subspecies because uh, I think he did not understand the meaning of subspecies. And of course, he never defined what he means by subspecies and species. So it's hard to look at what he thought, but you can guess what he thought based on uh, what decisions he made, taxonomic decisions he made. And uh, in 1932, there was not so much uh, use of male genitalia. Of course, Evans had started to use it, but his uh, 1949 book on Hespedi for example, used uh, uh, evidence from genitalia much more. And unfortunately, since I've highlighted 1932, I'll mention that many of the uh, taxonomic proposals that Evans had in 1932, he had already changed them um, in his 1949 book, but Indian uh, butterfly watchers, as well as even people who think they uh, are doing some serious work, do not really refer to the 1949 book. You just look at how many people have cited that book in taxonomic references or generally as what they're uh, treating as a species. And you look at how many people still cite Evans 1932. So people just haven't caught up with literature. People still uh, cite something which is sold, which nobody takes seriously, and that's a big problem. So what was great about what Evans did was that he did tens of thousands of genitalia dissections. You can't believe one person doing so much work, that was impressive. I just wish he had a better understanding of what species and subspecies were. But his work on Hesperids, Aropala, Curatus, and a few other groups is still uh, pretty interesting to refer to. But again, we need to bring it to a uh, uh, more recent uh, understanding of all of these things. And I'll just uh, point out uh, two examples. I've put here Abyssara icarius and Abyssara bifaciata. These are two species. If you look at uh, books on papers uh, published before, let's say 19, uh, I mean, 2011, everybody refers to Abyssara icarius for all of India. 
nobody even mentions PyFi Sieta. And everybody who has published any checklist, any uh, local fauna, any books, any papers, they all refer to Abhisara Acarius. Nobody refers to Bifaciata. Nobody refers to the uh, original paper, uh, the 1950 paper in which uh, this, uh, these two taxa were uh, really uh, separated. Uh, so earlier Bifaciata, if you look at Evans's book, you will see that um, uh, Evans had treated Bifaciata not as a distinct species, right? But if you um, look at everything else that was cited, people again go back to Evans, but there was a, a very clear uh, piece of work which was published. This was again uh, from some work done through uh, British uh, Museum of Natural History at that time, which is now called uh, Natural History Museum. Uh, so this was something uh, again sorted out long time ago. Yeah? This was Bennett's work in 1950, where he showed that Acarius and Bifaciata have different genitalia. So you look at Isaac Kimka's book, he just mentions Abhisara Acarius. And if you look at the image, it's really Bifaciata. You look at his image of uh, um, uh, Abhisara, um, the bandit Judy, um, it's actually a picture of Abhisara Kela. So until we started pointing out that you really have different species in India, based on the literature again we are not putting this uh, pulling this out of our head there are published resources published books published papers in which all the, of all all of this information has been out there for 60 years 70 years sometimes 80 years people just haven't been looking at literature just haven't been understanding where the scientific world is right now and we have been copying and pasting which is really shameful for a country like india which has done amazing scientific work. You look at Ramanujan and what he did for mathematics. You have produced great uh, uh, physicists, uh, chemists, some biologists. I just do not understand why is it that we haven't thought of these things and how we have not taken taxonomy and systematic theories. But all these things you really, really need to wake up, look around and understand that the world has moved on. Anyway, I've made my point. I'll just give a few uh, interesting examples which show uh, these problems. They illustrate uh, uh, this problem very well. And this is again from the uh, uh, book chapter that I published last year. This figure is from that book chapter. So if you want to know the details, you can look this up. But I'm gonna talk about two cases, uh, the case of Halpe, the ACES, and Baracus, which are uh, uh, hedgehoppers. And on this slide, I'm showing you Baracus. Um, um, I forget what the English name is uh, used for this. But anyway, Baracus vitatus is a species name used in all Indian books. Uh, again, with no reference to anything really, but uh, uh, on the right here, uh, right of the images that I've shown here, this is the upper side and to the right is the underside in all these images of the four Baraka species uh, in South Asia. And these are Evans's original drawings. Not all of them have been published. Some of them were published in 1949, but again, people just don't look at those, but the, the, this evidence exists. So these are Evans's original drawings, which again, I have personally uh, inspected and photographed in the Natural History Museum. There's an entire section of Evans's history collection, which again, I've looked at every single one of the specimen of every single species in those drawers. So I've seen every single specimen that Evans had looked at and more because I've gone around the world looking at various museums, including our own uh, collections at NCBS. All of this is based on this massive uh, work, piece of work that uh, has been done. Some of it is published and a lot more to come. But if you look at the uh, valves here, this is uh, one of the important male genital character. This is an organ in the uh, male genitalia. And again, you can read more about this in the book chapter that I mentioned that I've listed here on the right. So if you look at these valves, often taxonomies define species based on the differences of the valves. So they're considered really important. On the left side, uh, this row, the first row of uh, sketches here is uh, Uncas, the top view of Uncas. And this is the side view of the same, and this is the valve, which has been removed from this. 
but valve is the organ by which males uh, grasp the females during mating. And that's supposed to uh, work as a lock and key uh, mechanism. So uh, if they, this is the idea, which again, my student Dipendranath Basu is going to write about uh, in the next few months. The idea is that female genitalia and male genitalia have uh, um, some kind of a mechanism in which only species, individuals of the same species, male and female of the same species can mate with each other. If their genitalia are incompatible, then the mating cannot happen. Or if the mating happens, then it's not going to produce fertile offspring. That is the whole idea behind a lock and key mechanism, which separates species based on genitalia uh, structures. So which is why genitalia have been considered really important. And these, this is again 1949 people and you look around and people are still calling everything Baracus vititis for all of India. And you look at the phenotype, the Sri Lankan Baracus vititis, which should be considered an endemic species to Sri Lanka, has a very different phenotype, upper side and underside, compared to what we have in India. Uh, Baracus hamsoni, the commonest uh, species in India, has a very different appearance from the Sri Lankan one. You look at the genitalia, the valve is completely different. You show it to any taxonomist. I dare you to find one taxonomist who will look at this evidence of genitalia and call these the same uh, uh, species. Nobody is going to buy that. Uh, any modern taxonomist is not going to agree that these are the same species. So again, this has been out there. We have put it out now. And this is the reason why we treat these four uh, taxa as different species, for example. Same thing with uh, Halpe. Uh, so Halpe homolia, which has been called Indian ace, which is one of the strangest things that I can imagine. Halpe homolia was described from, from Singapore. Yeah, nowhere close to India. It doesn't even occur in India now, and people are calling it Indian ace. Very strange. And again, this evidence has been out there from 1949, Evans. And some of the species that I've listed here, Halpe, Handa, Purposa, Akma, Filda, Multa, Hindu, Ejena is the Sri Lankan one. That's the only Sri Lankan one. All the others occur in India. Uh, uh, one in uh, the Western Ghats shown here, which is Halpe Hindu and others in Northeast India. And then there are lots of other species uh, all the way from Southern China to uh, South China to Indochina and of course, Southeast Asia. And outside India, all the people, all the taxonomists have already 20, 30 years ago, started calling species which Evans had treated as subspecies of Alpe homolia as distinct species. So Indians are now stuck in this very strange situation where they believe that Halpe homolia, which is really a Singaporean taxon, not a very common one, then there are other different species in Southeast Asia. And then certainly in India, you have Halpe uh, homolia again. It just doesn't make any taxonomic sense. And if you again look at Evans' genetic uh, drawings, some of which have never been published before, they're found in Evans' uh, reference collection in the Natural History Museum London, which again I've photographed from which all these uh, have been redrawn. And you look at the heart, uh, the, you look at the wall, the uh, claspers again, very different. Not one of these taxa have any resemblance in their uh, uh, valve to anything else. So each one of these species, uh, each one of these taxa should really be uh, treated as distinct species. You look at their undersides and upper sides, they have very subtle differences. Potentially, if we uh, catch enough butterflies, dissect them, study them, confirm species identity, look at their uh, phenotype, you could potentially uh, uh, find consistent morphological differences. But the whole key that Evans wrote up is based on genitalia, and this is how different they are. So of course, they are different species. You have to see that no taxonomist, uh, no modern taxonomist will look at this and say that there are different subspecies of the same widespread species. And the genitalia basically look like this. On the left side are dissections that my uh, PhD student uh, Adipendra has done, and we are writing several papers based on this, including on evolution of genitalia. And these are two different species, for example, shown here. This is again side view of the uh, whole genital capsule that I mentioned. This is uncus. This is uh, the valve, uh, the clasper, and claspers is what are shown here on the right. Yeah. 
So if you wonder where this uh, organ is from, this is where it is from. And this is the inside uh, end of the genitalia. This is the outside end of the genitalia. And in cases like, let's say, Tony Costa, you can even see the uh, tip of the uncus um, protruding from the, uh, uh, from the upper uh, end of the upper rear end of the genitalia. So that is where you see that. And claspers, of course, in papilio butterflies, if you look at uh, a mating butterfly or even a male generally, which has opened up claspers, it, it opens up as, a, as two things that uh, almost uh, like a jaw can grab things. And those are the claspers, yeah? uh, technically called valves. So those are the structures that we are talking about. And because they have such an important function during mating, which is one of the most important stages of reproduction, and uh, which is again something that defines species uh, and subspecies. This is really important piece of evidence. Again, something that Indian uh, biologists, Indian butterfly watchers, had uh, have uh, neglected for decades now, even when the evidence has been out there. And uh, if you look at the distribution, as I mentioned. Uh, um, so actually, I'm going to go back. For Baracus vitatus, it's endemic to Sri Lanka. Uh, Baracus subvitatus, I mean subditus, which occurs at mid and high elevations in the Western Ghats, southern Western Ghats, it's endemic there. And of course, Baracus hampsoni, which is the commonest of all, most widespread of all, as I mentioned earlier, it occurs from southern Maharashtra all the way to uh, southern Kerala. And the fourth species, Baracus septentrio. Uh, Tentrionum, which again has a very different uh, genitalia, is uh, in northeastern India. Similarly, Halpe, if you look at these, these are all uh, mostly allopatric species. Some of them are sympatric. You have Aegina, which is um, uh, endemic to Sri Lanka. You have Hindu, which is endemic to the Western Ghats and some parts of southern India. And then you have this uh, uh, Okma, which is so far as known endemic to uh, uh, Northeast India and then parts of perhaps uh, going into uh, Southeastern Tibet, perhaps going into Southern China, Myanmar, and perhaps parts of Indo-China. Uh, but again, we need collections, we need dissections to confirm what species we are looking at. And some of them have been known only from few localities. Moltan, Filda, for example, historical records only from these areas but I believe that they will be uh, occurring more widely. We just need to collect and dissect and confirm species identities before uh, we can say confidently uh, what these things are. And again, there are quite a few people uh, going around saying, oh, this is Malta, this is Filda. There's absolutely no evidence for that. These people have never done dissections. They have never looked at genitalia. They don't even know how to dissect genitalia. So you should be asking, where is the evidence for these names? And here is some of the evidence that I'm showing. And of course, there will be more to come. Um, so what has really turned India around? One of the things is uh, that Indian economy uh, started to open up in the 1990s. Uh, Indian government at that time took a decision that we need this change. Before that, India was a very insular uh, place where nothing else was uh, happening. And we wouldn't allow anybody else to do it else in India either. But from the 1990s, when economy started to open up, everything else in the country also started to open up. Many more people started going abroad for training. And now there's reverse brain drain back in India. And a lot of very well-trained people have been coming back. I'm one of the uh, uh, waves of this reverse brain drain who came back in India because we saw a lot of opportunity to do scientific work in India. Otherwise, Earlier, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, no sane uh, biologist who was ambitious would have come back. Some of them came back, and those were the ones who really made a change. And that really facilitated more biologists. It encourages encouraged more biologists to come back. And I'm part of that reverse brain drain. And now we are, of course, training our own students. Dipendra is one of the examples in that uh, category. And Dipendra, by the way, is the same person who led the study of Tarukas, the Piros, which we published last year, with both genitalia dissections, comparing them with Evans's work, and of course, uh, early stages of six of the eight species, along with tremendous amount of taxonomic uh, information, 
and review in that paper, along with designation of type specimens of each one of the Indian tarugas. So that is really the kind of um, work that we need to do. And this is possible because we are training students now. I'm here talking to you because um, I don't want to just do very good work and I don't want to just publish in very good journals and make a name for myself, but there has to be a legacy of what goes on when good people start doing very rigorous work. So many of you should really be taking this up uh, forward because a few people are just not going to cut it. You look at how many taxonomists, how many serious biologists, butterfly biologists there are in England, in Germany, any of the Western European countries, uh, North America, including uh, uh, Mexico, and of course the US and Canada, tremendous number of butterfly biologists, along with many very good butterfly uh, naturalists. They have been doing so much work. Many of them know more about uh, butterflies in their country than our professional biologists know in our country. And that really has to change. And unfortunately, I'm very sorry to say, except two labs, my lab in MCBS and Ullasa Kodandaramaya's lab in uh, Isa uh, Thiruvannandapuram, there's not a single group in India which is doing serious enough work that is worth mentioning for its scientific rigor. Um, actually, that is how it was in terms of labs. And now certainly there's, there are pockets which are emerging, ZSI. For a long time, uh, ZSI was not involved in butterfly taxonomy. Of course, there were taxonomists doing other things, but now there are uh, several people who have joined, Navneet Singh, uh, and several others who are doing wonderful work on moth taxonomy. Some of them have published new butterfly species or new butterfly records for India. Uh, um, several others have started to get more serious. At least they go back to literature refer to the right papers, cite them in their papers before they even uh, uh, report a species. But we really need to get into this very rigorous taxonomic work before we can do this. And again, if you want to do this sort of work, come to NCBS, come to my lab, I can train you, and then you can carry this over wherever you are. But seriously, start questioning everything that people say is the, uh, is the scientific understanding standing because a lot of what goes around in India is based on very old work which has not been reviewed again. So this is changing because a lot of us as well as those who now look around read uh, more modern scientific papers talk to uh, working scientists in India as well as abroad have been looking at modern evidence and this is where uh, things are changing. So what is turning around India? I would say this reverse brain drain is one thing Opening up of India is another thing. And of course, that brings us to my second major point, which is revolution in uh, 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 internet, including which uh, what it has unleashed with its citizen science. And we have talked about it in the last two uh, talks that I gave you. But this new uh, uh, internet, which is open and which is accessible to anybody who has a phone or a computer and internet can access taxonomic expertise anywhere in the world. And that has really changed uh, how Indians see uh, or should see what their role is in uh, contributing to scientific studies, as well as seriously taking up charge of several scientific projects and doing this. If you look at a lot of European biologists, uh, Japanese uh, taxonomists, American taxonomists, they're not working professionals. Uh, I mean, they, they're not working biologists, working in research institutions. They may have day jobs. In England, for example, I know several people who have who work in banks. They, in fact, have very high positions in banks uh, to the level of bank managers and so on. And then one day a week, they would uh, go to Natural History Museum London, spend some time there, help, uh, help the museum curate the existing specimens or do their own natural history work or taxonomic work or whatever else they like. You don't have to be a working taxonomist, but you do need to have professional understanding of where biology stands now and what the cutting edge is for taxonomy or biology of butterflies before you can contribute well. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of Indians are not well trained to do that. There's tremendous enthusiasm. Every single one of you is capable of doing very good work. You have to ask yourself, people you listen to, people you look up to, what have they published? What, have, what discoveries have they made? What reference have they cited? How many species specimens have they looked at? 
what dissections have they done how much field work have they done what discoveries have they made both in taxonomy and biology before you choose your leaders and before you choose your idols choose them well and every single one of you can do tremendous amount of work so with this uh, historical background and what needs to change about taxonomy i will just mention some of the work that i've done so i'm going to start with taxonomy and museum resources and of course this is something that i have developed in ncbs you of course have zsi you have uh, various other uh, regional centers nbir in uh, bengaluru is a fantastic one university of agricultural sciences in bengaluru dharwad and several other places in karnataka these are massive resources for taxonomic uh, uh, work because these have uh, lakhs upon lakhs of specimens that you can study and you really need access to specimens if you want to do taxonomic work iari in uh, new delhi is a fantastic uh, uh, place to do taxonomic work our shashank pathur who is a faculty member there is doing amazing work um, uh, as i mentioned in zsi kolkata i'm more familiar with but kolkata chennai kolkata pune uh, i mean what am i saying zsi chennai zsi pune zsi uh, in uh, kerala uh, in himachal pradesh there are several centers which are doing really good work go to people who are doing solid work and i'm going to talk about ncbs because of my familiarity and also because what i've created here and this is certainly at the cutting edge of what museum resources are but of course if you are in different parts of india there will be local resources local museum local experts that you can consult but as i mentioned use them well choose them carefully yeah so uh, ncbs this is our campus uh, this building is where i work and our collections are also uh, placed here it's a beautiful campus uh, quite green and this is an autonomous institute funded by the government of india so we are sort of government and uh, sort of a research center so we basically combine best of both the worlds and uh, it has been a leader in biological uh, sciences for the last 27 28 years uh, since we started but we are part of tifr tata institute of fundamental Uh, research which is uh, with the head uh, which with the center in uh, kolaba uh, in mumbai and uh, tifr on the whole has had a long history more than 70 years of doing cutting edge research initially in physics and uh, mathematics but with the establishment of department of uh, biological sciences dbs in kolaba and then in cbs 27 28 years ago in uh, bengaluru we have been a leader in uh, traditional traditionally strong biological sciences like molecular and developmental biology but about uh, 15 years ago ncbs started investing a lot in ecological sciences as well and we have some international funding and faculty members and since mid 2000s uh, as i mentioned we have uh, developed a lot in ecology evolution conservation biology and after i joined we have uh, expanded quite a bit in taxonomy and systematics as well so my lab at ncbs is called biodiversity lab because we do a variety of biodiversity related work not just taxonomy or not just evolution biology but i come from the background of uh, wildlife ecology evolution biology and more recently i've expanded into molecular taxonomy systematics molecular uh, uh, genetics and so on so we have a fairly broad understanding with which um, uh we have developed this mantra and again you can read more about this in the book chapter that i mentioned but the mantra is basically observe collect inspect sequence yeah and there's some order in this and you can't see all the text perhaps you can but if you can't i will just read this out so that you get some understanding of what we are trying to um uh, encourage you to do but this is where all of us need to be doesn't matter if you are an amateur uh, butterfly watcher doesn't matter if you are uh, a starting biologist doesn't matter you are still a student doesn't matter whether you are a medical doctor or a retired person or a housewife house husband whatever you are you really need to step up if you are serious about butterflies and if you want to have an opinion about Uh, uh butterfly names about butterfly species identity about biodiversity about total list whatever it is you really need to know what you're talking about and i'm going to tell you how you can get there it's not only that we need to all step up and i'm not saying that i'm the ultimate expert 
I'm just slightly more advanced than you are, and I have a long journey to make as well. And of course, I'm doing all of this as my journey, but you need to start as well and not really stay static. Because as I mentioned, science advances and we have to advance both as a society uh, which is educated in science, but also with this audience specifically, what we need to do to advance Indian science, to advance what we know about uh, 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 Indian butterflies. And this is really uh, uh, where we need to begin. And of course, some of you, especially students, if you take this seriously, who knows, maybe you will build a career like I have. But you need to start your journey. Where you end uh, your journey, where you stay, is really up to you, whether you want to become a professional or not, or whatever else there is. But you need to make the journey. And that is my, my biggest appeal to this. So anyway, what is our mantra? Observe, collect, inspect, sequence. First thing, when you're in the field, you need to observe a lot. There are ecological issues that, ecological parameters that you need to take down. There are ecological studies that you need to know, uh, to do. You have to know habitat use, climatic envelopes in which butterfly uh, species and populations occur. The climatic conditions in the Western Ghats for high elevation species, let's say, uh, are different from the climatic envelopes that you see in uh, the Himalaya. My student, uh, Shubham Gautam, uh, uh, just a couple of months ago, uh, published a paper with me on uh, 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 elevational use and seasonal phenotype of the Asian cabbage white. These are sorts of interesting studies that we need to know, do so that we know more relevant ecological information about our species. We know, need to look at how populations fluctuate in space and time over India, we need to know the phenology of early stages. When are caterpillars found? How long do they take? On what plants do they feed? On what plant parts do they feed? If you vary those conditions, what happens to them? Does the population still do well? What are the community dynamics? Which species co-occur? Which species occur at what elevation in relation to, let's say, the plants that they feed on or the parasitoids that uh, uh, kill them? And so on and so forth. These intra in specific interactions need to be studied. In behavior, we need to know how butterflies forage, uh, how they use host plants, how do they avoid competition with other species which use the same plants, and so on and so forth. And this, of course, applies to everything else, whether it's tree sap, whether it's any other uh, habitats uh, or resources that they use. So we need to know all these things. And again, ask yourself, how many people publish uh, research papers which deal with this sort of things. Just today, I got a notification for a paper from Ulasa Kundaramaya's lab on uh, basic biology of uh, uh, common evening brown. Very nice paper. Detailed natural history, no fancy, very high level evolutionary biology or genetics, which nobody else uh, who is outside an evolutionary, uh, outside a scientific institution could do. That paper is something that anybody in their backyard, perhaps with a small cage uh, to raise caterpillars can do. Anybody who is in a college, anybody who works in a college department or university department with absolutely basic lab facilities and basic greenhouse facilities and a sketch pen or a marker, really permanent marker can do. These are things, the reason why I like that paper a lot is how simple it is and how important it is in terms of understanding the biology of that species. That is really the kind of work we need to do. And these are again things that you can do. Some of the things that I'm going to talk about at the base of the slide are things that you will need to do in a big research institution like mine, where you uh, will need the resources and the expertise that we have. But that's later. The first two, absolutely you can do. The third one, Many parts of it uh, you can do even as an amateur, even as a university professor, as a student, or even a serious amateur. So courtship, oviposition, all these things were covered in the paper that I just mentioned on common evening brown. So it can be done. Life histories, early stages, a lot of people in India, a lot of amateurs in India are now doing this kind of work. Really wonderful, Hemant Pugli, one of the, uh, one of the viewers, now um, in Gujarat, and of course um, um, from 
uh, Tripura, um, what's his name? Suman. Um, no, just a minute. Uh, Shamal Devnath. Shamal Devnath has done amazing work on early stages from Northeast India. Tarun Karmakar recently uh, has done uh, more than 50 species, if I remember correctly. Uh, in uh, leading from him, there is a group of us who published a paper two years ago, 2018. The Western Guards uh, butterfly uh, larvalose plants was one paper we published uh, that year, and the early stages of nearly 70 uh, species from Northeast was the second paper that we published uh, that year. And that paper, 70 species, that's a lot of species, and many of those species had never been uh, raised from eggs and caterpillars before. These were among the first records for uh, the world for some of these species. The very first records of caterpillars and eggs, caterpillars and pupae for many of those species and all of those species nearly were uh, first records for India for sure. So new larvalose plants, new phenotypes of caterpillars. Tremendous amount of information packed in that one paper. That is the kind of work that we need to do. And that is fortunately the kind of work which anybody, a 10 grade student can do, as long as he or she is guided properly, trained properly in both taking observation as well as uh, writing uh, papers. So these are things people you really need to start doing. Again, I mentioned this before and I'll mention this again, before meaning the last two talks as well as earlier today. Indians love to fight. There are stupid fights happening on Facebook and on WhatsApp every single day. What the hell are we doing when we can do all these things? Fighting on these social media, honestly. So get back to doing this sort of work and there's so much to do. We can take biology and natural history and taxonomies, Indian butterflies to a whole new level. And if all of us, every single one of us take up some uh, species group or even a single species, you know, things around your house, you know, things that occur in uh, your backyard, plain tiger, how much do we really know about its biology in India? In Africa, tremendous amount has been done. India, nothing seriously, apart from maybe five or 10 very basic natural history papers, nothing else. People are discovering that it has a new uh, Z chromosome, I mean W chromosome, a completely new chromosome that has evolved in uh, some of these uh, uh, recently diverse species, this phenomenal biology that we are understanding, the whole uh, uh, variation that you see, uh, the plain tiger that you know with black tip and uh, uh, black four wing tip and white uh, band. Then there's the form Inaria and uh, others where you either don't have the uh, black and white tip or you have the white hind wing. This tremendously interesting uh, information now about what those uh, forms are. And many uh, people believe that those are different species in Africa. In India, who knows? Uh, because no work has been done. We have zero information on the genetic of uh, uh, those different forms. But what we do know is that uh, those do have some interesting ecological and genetic basis. And all of that work is from Africa. Now you look at how many scientists there are in Africa and how much we know of this biology. You look at how many people watch and study butterflies in India and where the hell are we in all of this? Nowhere, really shameful. But every single one of you can start changing that. So identify an interesting problem. If you can find an interesting problem, you can even do more advanced scientific work. But start from the basics, do some very basic natural history, which has an interesting ecological handle. Last time I talked about this, I mentioned uh, uh, work on migration done by my PhD student Vaishali uh, Baumik. There was no information on this naturally, uh, on this uh, migration, the annual migration of day nines in South India, beyond the fact that it happens. And the most rigorous hypothesis of how that happens was my own paper in 2005. After that, Vaishali published a paper in 2018 and then again uh, in 2020, just last month. And these are the only very, uh, uh, advanced scientific papers on that migration. We didn't say, oh, there's no natural history on this, so how, what do we know? We just worked hard, did a lot of work, uh, brought that natural history to modern scientific analysis, and we have those papers which have been widely appreciated. You don't have to be a very experienced biologist to do these things. 
you just have to be good at asking interesting questions. And every single one of you can do that with a, perhaps a little bit of help, which I can offer, which Lhasa can offer, which other uh, good biologists and taxonomists and systematists can offer. You just need to uh, decide that that is what you're going to do. All right, so that's observe. When you're in the field, don't do just photography or don't do just one kind of uh, uh, project. Just observe everything, take notes about everything. This is what I do. You will constantly see me writing in my notebook and I'm writing where did I see a species? When did I see a species? What it was doing? I'm taking 30 minute counts constantly when I'm in the field. I'm taking uh, observations on which butterfly is feeding on which flower so that we know uh, uh, butterfly and nectar plant associations. I'm noting down egg laying or whatever else that I see. I'm taking pictures of mud puddling uh, spots on which people are like communities of mud puddling butterflies. There are so many things that you can do from very simple natural history tales. When you go to even your backyard or a, a park nearby, or a big national park or a wildlife sanctuary very far away from your house. You just choose what is convenient, but the interesting questions to be addressed, no matter where you go, you just need to look. Now, this is something that everybody can do. The observe part, the blue box is something that absolutely everybody can do. The collect part is where it starts to become more specialized. Again, some of you can uh, do this. Uh, but you will need some preparation. So, for example, you need to build massive reference collections. These have to be done um, um, responsibly. For example, collection of specimens is not uh, widely allowed. You need to get permission from the forest department if you're doing this from uh, areas uh, under the ownership of forest department. Or if these are uh, scheduled species, then no matter where you collect them from, you do need to get permission from the forest department uh, to collect these species. So not everybody can do it. Fortunately, through NCBS, we have been able to do it. Um, a large part of what we do in the field nowadays is building towards this so that we can do all the subsequent parts, the, the next two boxes that I mentioned. But we do need this. If you want to go to older uh, collections, for example, uh, IARI in uh, New Delhi that I mentioned earlier has a very good collection. Um, uh, the uh, Forest Research Institute in Dehradun has a uh, decent collection. They don't have uh, a lot of modern collections. Very few specimens have been collected recently, but at least the historical collections from the British era are uh, pretty good. And they have many rare species, species that you can't even see nowadays commonly are there in the collections. Uh, of course, ZSI Kolkata is the biggest collection of Indian butterflies. Uh, also the biggest collection of type specimens in India. So these are collections that are accessible for a long time. Unfortunately, ZSI was not as open, but fortunately with two successive uh, directors who have just changed the whole work culture at ZSI, uh, ZSI has certainly become much more open. Of course, you need training, you need proper uh, scientific attitude and preparation before you can go to ZSI and study those collections. But at least if you have that, the DSI is now open. So go there, write to the director, um, ask them for permission to study things, go work with the scientists there, benefit from what they know. And of course, uh, if you are expert, go and help them with uh, uh, whatever you can. For example, I've helped with a few type specimens uh, there. Um, uh, recently, Dr. Sheila from uh, ZSI Kolkata, along with uh, several other people in ZSI have published a book on type specimens of butterflies from ZSI. So if you don't have that book, get hold of that book. It's a very nice compilation of uh, both the pictures of type specimens are there, but also uh, some information about the descriptions uh, is also there. So it's a very nice reference. Go uh, get your hands on that book. And of course, we need to go much further than that, but that's a good beginning. So in terms of reference collections, I mentioned some of these older collections. And of course, there are others, several in Chennai, for example, there are some regional centers have collections. Many colleges and universities are uh, making their own collections, which is all good. But again, wherever you work, get permission from the forest department, uh, comply with these rules, of course, but also get them involved. They always like to know what you're doing. 
new species you're discovering, new species or range extensions in India that you have discovered. It's all nice when we all work together. Anyway, the reason I mentioned old collections is that it's not that nothing exists in India. Unfortunately, the most important collections, uh, apart from ZSI Kolkata, are not in India. And again, ZSI Kolkata has, if I remember correctly, not more than maybe 200 uh, to 300 type specimens uh, or type specimen, type specimens or species, butterfly species specifically. There are many more. But that compared to, let's say, Natural History Museum London, where you have thousands upon thousands of type specimens only from India. Yeah, and then they have tens of thousands from the rest of the world. So that is the kind of reference collections that I'm talking about. And we do need to build them up. Now, of course, every specimen that we collect has to be used very well. For example, I mentioned georeference data for range mapping here, climate change studies. The georeferencing of data of every specimen that you collect is important. Frozen tissue libraries for molecular work are important. And at NCBS, we have all of these. But of course, we need these everywhere. I know, for example, ZSI has started it, has started taking molecular uh, tissue, I mean, frozen tissue for molecular work. They also have a sequencing lab, so some work can be done there. But of course, we need much more advanced expertise in sequencing, as well as systematics to be able to do that kind of work. And many other reputed institutions, for example, do not have that. Many leading in, uh, universities do not have that. Many leading research institutions do not have adequate resources and expertise to do this sort of uh, work. For example, WII in Dehradun, DNHS in Mumbai, uh, many of the ISOs that have come up all over India, they just do not have either reference collections or expertise or frozen facilities to do this kind of modern work. So we need to up our game in all these areas. And of course, once you have collections, even existing collections like those of RSI and IRI and uh, um, uh, University of Agricultural Sciences here in uh, Bengaluru, we need to massively update our curation protocols, our databases, our imaging, online specimen repositories. If you look at several museums, you will see that they all have these things. It's just an idea that people don't even take it seriously that every specimen that comes to a museum has to be databased. Every specimen has to have a number you look at a lot of things. You look at Forest Research Institute, for example, they do not number their specimens. You look at uh, many other um, modern collections, I won't keep on telling names. They do not have databases, uh, electronic databases, from which you can quickly pull up specimen information and they then do stuff. It facilitates research work tremendously. It makes everybody's life easy, but we just haven't caught up with a lot of these things. And this is where a lot of um, uh, a lot of modern work comes into play. So even if you have good reference collections, for example, those in ZSI and IRI and uh, uh, Forest Research Institute (FRI), we need to upgrade the curation to bring it up to speed with what, let's say, National History Museum or Smithsonian uh, institutions, National History Museum or the Medway Center for uh, uh, Lepidoptera. Uh, is doing. So that's the kind of level we need to get at. And we don't have too much time. I remind you, our habitats are being lost. A lot of butterfly populations are vanishing. And while they still exist, we need to do all these things so that we have some information based on which we can uh, uh, fashion some conservation action. Yeah? So we really need to wake up and get started on all these things if we want to have some effect on both the trajectory of scientific research as well as conservation. All right, as I mentioned, the uh, National History Museum London is still going to have a much larger uh, reference collection than we have in India. I mean, all of Indian collections put together is not 10% of what National History Museum has from India. And that picture is not going to change considering how difficult it is to get permission from the forest department to collect specimens, how difficult it is to build infrastructure to maintain those reference collections. It is not going to be easy going forward. Fortunately, I've been able to do this in NCBS. A few other people might have been able to do elsewhere. If you are that person or that institution, please drop me an email. I would like to know about what you have been doing so that we can perhaps 
start the collaboration, learn from each other, uh, maybe even exchange specimens, a number of things. We have a memorandum of understanding with ZSI, for example, and we send some of the type specimens there. We train some of the uh, people there. We have collaborated with several uh, scientists from ZSI. So we do need to uh, go across these uh, institutional boundaries and all of that can only happen if we uh, are online, uh, if we have agreement, this is where we need to go. But I mentioned data repatriation here, and that is something very important. As I mentioned, NHM is still gonna have larger collection. They still gonna have magnitudes of uh, more type specimens than India will ever have. Most of the Indian species have been collected and named uh, so, I suspect that we might have 100 or 200 or even 300, 400 more Indian butterflies to be described, both as range extension in India, as well as new species and subspecies. So 100, really no problem. I'm pretty sure we'll uh, get there in my lifetime. But if you keep on doing these studies, perhaps if we expand the total number of uh, butterfly biologists and taxonomists who are doing this sort of work, I suspect that even uh, in my lifetime, we might see 200, 250 more species added to Indian butterfly fauna. Uh, so really not uh, uh, unthinkable. Whereas if you talk to some of these old folks, they think that, oh, everything is described and there's nothing to uh, do in terms of taxonomy or in terms of taxonomy discovery. Really not true. People, taxonomists from other places are doing it. Indians are not, and we really need to get up to speed to that. But anyway, data repatriation, what does that mean? One of the reasons why many Indians have not been able to describe new species or understand that what they're looking at is a new species because they just don't have access to all this information. They can't access um, uh, collections at Natural History Museum London. Nash NHM charges 300 pounds per week in bench fees. So that's 300 pounds into 100 is what you have to pay them every week. And you can only work from 10 to four, Monday to five days of the week, uh, you know, uh, six hours a day. And they charge you 300 pounds people. Most of us cannot even afford to pay those fees. And then there's living in London, which is very expensive. Flight to London, everything adds up. It's just not feasible for most of us to go to London and look at specimens there. So what data repatriation means is that at least we can get pictures of the historical uh, museum materials. We can get images of type specimens. We can get databases with label information of all these specimens that exist outside. And a lot of museums in fact now agree that data, at least data, and in many cases specimens also have to be repatriated to the country of origin, in this case, India. And unfortunately, we don't have the infrastructures enough to accept the entire Indian collection, uh, uh, butterfly collection at NHM, for example. But at least we can start getting data back. So what I've been doing for the, uh, since 2007 really, but more seriously since 2012 when I joined as an NCTS faculty member, is that I've been going to NHM, uh, two weeks at a time, a month or two months at a time. And uh, my students, especially uh, Dependra and I, have, for example, taken 40,000 images of museum specimens. We have photographed every single subspecies and species of butterfly that uh, is deposited in NHM that occurs in India and several from neighboring countries as well. We have photographed more than 15,000 specimens that more specimens that most uh, other people in India have seen. Forget about actually inspected. A lot of experts, experts in courts go around saying, oh, this is what I think this is and this is what, they have never seen specimens. They've never been to a serious museum. They have never seen what some of these species look like. I mentioned Abhisara Kela, Abhisara uh, bifaciata. The reason why people did not know these species is because they had no clue what they look like. It's only because I've seen those specimens that, and of course, we are always generous in sharing information through butterflies of India or otherwise, that we have been able to put it out a lot. And everybody has benefited from it, of course, but you know what happens on Facebook. 
So what we really need to do is, as more and more data get repatriated, we need resources where, uh, online resources like Let's Say Butterflies of India website, where a lot of these uh, uh, data along with images and labels are deposited. If you go to uh, Bhutanitis uh, Ladlavi species page on Butterfly India, you will see images of the five type specimens of that species that exist. Our website is the only one which has uh, those images, all five of them with label data. We have permission from the Natural History Museum London to display those images on our website. And we want to do this for all the species. I'm just finishing a couple of books, a couple of taxonomic monographs. After that, uh, we'll be able to do this once this information comes out in peer reviewed journals and peer reviewed monographs, then we'll be able to share that information. But we have that information. Every single one who can afford to go to NHM or afford to go to, let's say, Maguire Center in Florida, or uh, uh, let's say several museums, the one in Paris, the Natural History Museum in uh, Paris, again, has a lot of Indian material, historical material, 80, 90, 100, 150 years old. But we have been photographing some of you who have the resources, financial or otherwise, who can go to these museums and photograph these specimens, bring back all the data, um, uh, will be very useful. And as I mentioned, we have, a, we have an MOU with ZSI. We also have an MOU with Natural History Museum London. So we get to go there, we get to photograph those specimens, we get to write papers with them. The Tarukas paper that I mentioned, that Dipendra led, had uh, one of the curators there as a co-author. And she helped a lot, especially in designating electrotypes uh, 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 and paralectrotypes. Those are uh, newly designated uh, name-bearing types. For example, if you are not a taxonomist, and if you want to know, so all Indian uh, uh, eight, uh, species of Indian tarukas now have electrotypes or paralectrotypes or holotypes identified because of the work that we have done. This is what I mean by data repatriation as well as collaborations with these museums so that we can do this. So once we have these photographs of museum specimens put upon the website, these will be accessible to every single one of you. We need to build this sort of resources. Butterflies of India is probably the only, uh, best one so far, not probably, it is the best one so far. We will make it even better, but we do need more and more collaborations as well as platforms where this sort of information can be gathered. All right, so that's about collect as well, uh, which is reference collection, excavation of the material that we gather, and of course, getting uh, our data back from the specimens which have gone out of the country. And unfortunately, many Indians still spend, send specimens outside, which is, by the way, illegal. So a lot of these folks who keep talking on uh, social media about collecting and uh, uh, publishing elsewhere, they are sending specimens outside, which is illegal. And you have to know that. A, you need permit from the forest department for the two uh, areas that I mentioned, either land owned by forest department or uh, scheduled species that you may get permission to collect. And then there is permission to export from the National Biodiversity Authority. And these people haven't done any of that. And that is a serious violation. Unfortunately, some of the uh, loud voices on social media are part of that gang. And you really need to be careful because someday this is going to bite. All right. So if you have the resources, for example, you work in ZSI or IRI, absolutely go ahead. There is so much work that needs to be done with existing specimens or the new specimens that you will collect. If you don't have those resources, write to me, write to director of ZSI, write to whoever else has collections and which are maintained well. Many of them are not maintained well. I had gone to a collection some years ago, nearly 20 years ago to be precise, and I was almost in tears. There, is, there was this six foot tall, beautiful teak wood chest of drawers. Uh, all these specimens were collected by Woodhouse more than 100 years ago when I saw this, or nearly 100 years ago when I saw this in 2000. And that entire collection was completely engulfed by uh, uh, fungus. You could see the tips of the pins and tips of the uh, 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 wings. Everything else was ruined by this. Woodhouse collection, such an important historical collection, all gone because this, this NGO 
had not maintained it well. Really sad and really shameful. These are the institutions where we have interested our national collections, type specimens and others, and they're not being maintained. So uh, go to the collections where these things are maintained well, ZSI and IARI and NBIR, NBIR in Bangalore, apart from US, uh, University of Bangalore, are some of these. Uh, FRI is actually maintained pretty well. And uh, that's remarkable because their taxonomy program is not that big, but the uh, care that they have taken in maintaining this is amazing. And many of these are old wooden drawers, but they have been maintained well. And of course, uh, regional centers in ZSI are also reasonably well equipped, although I really wish that the government would give them more funding to expand all these. Anyway, so if you don't have access, go to places where there is access and where there's more uh, modern taxonomy and systematic uh, being done and biology in general. And I think there'll be tremendous um, benefits of doing that for the country as well as for you as a person. Okay, so inspect and sequence. Some of inspect is again with uh, museum work, but a lot of uh, that will have to be uh, work that you do starting from uh, specimens, yes, but a lot of advanced work that you need to do. So. Sexual variation, intra and interpopulation variation, variations in genitalia, reproductive isolation, morphometric studies need to be done. All these things need to be looked at. Uh, Kalinaga, something that people have been talking about for a long time. We call them freak in English. Everybody thinks it's one species. It's really four species in India and potentially five. Uh, and again, if you look at what modern taxonomists understand, based on, I mentioned morphometric studies, this is the sort of work that you need to look at, which again, Dependra and several other people in my lab have done. And from that, we do know there's evidence to treat these as different species. Several internationally reputed taxonomists who have looked at these groups recently have again realized with molecular evidence as well as genitalia that these are distinct species. So species are defined not only by one parameter by one line of evidence. Species are really uh, defined by, um, so actually I'll take a step back and mention that you have variation at all levels from individuals within a population to different species. Yeah, So individuals within a single population, some of us are short, some of us are tall, some of us are small, some of us are large. We have blue eyes, gray eyes, black eyes, brown eyes, uh, our hair color, skin color, everything varies. Of course, all those kinds of things vary in natural populations of other species as well. Butterflies have variation. In common Mormon, you have three female forms that are well-defined, and then you have intermediates between these forms. But at least the three forms are very well-defined. Similarly, you have more than uh, uh, 10, 15, I mean, 15, 20 forms in Great Mormon. And these are just forms which have been named. Then you have variation. You have dicism form, wet season form. You have clinal variation. Klein is uh, a situation where over space, uh, some environmental factors change. And with that, morphology of the population and species also changes. That is called a Klein. And it's a very important uh, uh, evolutionary concept, which has tremendous uh, importance in taxonomic studies as well. For example, uh, a lot of subspecies, so-called subspecies, have been uh, described from southern and northern uh, Western Ghats. Many species are supposed to have uh, different subspecies in uh, eastern, western, and uh, uh, central Himalaya. But if you look at the rainfall patterns, if you look at uh, temperature, if you look at a number of things, these populations really should not have subspecies names. They should really be considered a client. And by definition, both in evolutionary biology as well as in taxonomy, different parts of the cline, different variations, which are often continuous across a cline cannot be given taxonomic names. They are just variations within a single population along a cline. Yeah? But unfortunately, a lot of Indian taxonomists and even worse, people who think they know taxonomy and make decisions about what a species and subspecies is, try to fit, fit everything in that uh, line, which is never going to work. Because as I mentioned, as you go from, let's say, 300 meters in Delhi 
to uh, uh, 5,000 meters high up in Western Himalaya, you do have gradation within a species. Here is Canadia, the Asian cabbage white I mentioned. Uh, if you look at lower and higher elevation in one season, you will see that uh, lower elevation specimens are much more lighter compared to higher elevation specimens. If you look at summer and winter, you will see that winter specimens are darker compared to summer specimens. But if you go to museums, often you, uh, collections are small. You have five or 10 individuals from here and there. And if somebody had made a trip to let's say higher elevation in the Himalaya in one month, you have basically variation captured only from that month. And if somebody has gone to lower elevation in a different season, or even in that season, you're gonna see butterflies which look different. From that, you're gonna conclude that those are two different subspecies because they have morphological differences. But when you do a detailed study like what Subham was able to do, you see that yes, male and female have consistent differences. Females are consistently more dark compared to males. Yes, summer individuals on the whole are paler on both upper side and underside compared to um, uh, winter individuals. And again, I mentioned lower and higher elevation. But if you pick up any particular individual and you try to tell me where it has come from, you're going to, I guarantee you, you're going to be wrong in many cases. In some cases, by chance, you may be correct in saying that this butterfly has come from higher elevation, but often you are going to be wrong just because there's so much variation in a species. So there's individual, sexual, and clinal variation in this species along the elevational gradient in Himalaya. Yeah? These things we do need to study before we decide that something is a species or subspecies. So if you ask me in cases like Halpe, where genitalia evidence is just so overwhelming and just so unequivocal that I have no qualms about calling every single uh, name taxon of Halpe in India as a distinct species. Whatever have been called subspecies of Halpe homolia just does not hold up for the scientific evidence that we have at hand. Now, if you ask me whether several Nepti species along Himalaya are distinct subspecies or not, I can't tell you because we just don't have information on the clinal variation from Eastern to Western Himalaya or uh, lower to higher elevation in each part of these Himalaya. If you ask me something about, let's say, actually another really interesting example, uh, Plains cupid, very common species. Everybody knows it. Everybody thinks they know it really well. In Sri Lanka, only the wet season form is known. Yeah? And uh, in India, both wet and dry season forms are known. In Myanmar, again, uh, uh, Myanmar or Southern uh, Thailand, something like that, I'll have to look up. Again, only the wet season form occurs. And in some of these areas, they have been called different subspecies. But if you look at wet season form variation within these populations, Sri Lanka versus, let's say, uh, uh, Maharashtra, you will see that the variation that you see within a population, within a generation even, is overlapping, which means that you cannot define subspecies based on that variation. So just calling something as a population with wet and dry season form versus a subspecies which has only one form, in this case, wet season form in Sri Lanka, is just wrong. If you're going to define subspecies based on the fact that you have two forms in one area and another, and this is, I'm not talking about seasonal forms now, any other forms is wrong. If you're going to define subspecies based on larger and smaller, that is just not going to hold up to scientific uh, inquiry and scientific thinking right now. I'll give you an example of um, golden sapphire. Evans described one more species from, uh, uh, from Manipur, uh, Nagaland area, major. Yeah? And he called it major because it's a larger subspecies compared to let's say what you find in the Himalaya. You look at variation, there's just no way you can tell this is from uh, Northeast and this is from Himalaya. In the Himalaya, they tend to be smaller, but only in certain generations, not in others. So Evans just happened to have fewer specimens of uh, golden sapphire. Can you have Rama in the Naturalist Museum? His own specimens as well as whatever everybody else had collected. So the population that he had access to in Nagaland, for example, some of the specimens were larger, not all of them. If you look at the variation in size in what he described as major, 
there is variation and some of that variation is overlapping with the variation that you see in Himalaya. He still went ahead and called it a subspecies major and it has to be a synonym. You cannot treat it as a subspecies because the variation uh, across these populations is so overlapping that you cannot define that subspecies based on any morphological features. Yeah. So these, these are the kinds of things that you need to sort out by looking at, this is where the inspect part comes in. Looking at the morphology variation, and of course by morphology, I mean not only wing color, but morph morphometric measurements as well. And that's again something that Vaishali has published a couple of papers on migration based on, and Dipendra has published something uh, based on wing shape analysis, for example, really remarkable work. Uh, we will have a couple of papers submitted in the next uh, few months, I think, which will sort out some of the taxonomic problems as well as a few other interesting ecological problems. So this is what we need to do by inspecting specimens. We need to quantify color patterns, wing shapes, characterization of taxonomically important traits such as wing color patterns, wing venation. Not many people study that. Genitalia structures have been studied really well. This Taxonomists everywhere study that. But for example, several Yipuna species, the rings that have been described from India in the last 20 years, people did a horrible job of dissecting those butterflies. They did not uh, 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 compare genitalia from those specimens, what they were describing as new species, with the genitalia of related species which occur in the same habitats and which are very, very close morphologically. And now it turns out that some of them are synonyms, which is again a shameful situation uh, for a taxonomist because, of course, if you if more data just shows that what you knew at the time was uh, uh, incomplete and our understanding had changed, so that what you what you described as a species or subspecies doesn't hold up, fine. You know we all learn from more work that comes up. But if you have not done something, even when you could, for example, compare genitalia and you were wrong in describing something, that is bad. And several Indian taxonomists, both in butterfly biology as well as outside, have unfortunately done that. So we need to do these things to be able to do solid taxonomic work. Dependra's work on Tarukas genitalia and other things is important from that uh, standpoint that we looked at the early stages, we found them to be different. We looked at uh, genitalia, those were different. And of course, we sorted out type specimens. That's the kind of good work you could do by inspecting specimens. Um, and this is gonna to lead to a lot of, oh, by the way, I've also listed characterization of uh, traits. And under that I've mentioned labial pulps, androconia, these are just things that have been used in, uh, um, used in a lot of historical literature uh, over many, many, many decades now. So we need to start doing that. And that is going to lead to taxonomic revisions. Caraxes and polyura, I mentioned, formally, taxonomically, Caraxes is the correct genus name. Polyura has been merged into Caraxes because it's uh, phylogenetically not distinct. And again, this is something very, very hard for Indians to understand. I don't know why. Maybe need, they need to learn uh, a little bit of phylogeny, a little bit of taxonomy, and of course, a little bit of systematics from working uh, uh, biologists so that these um, uh, ideas, these concepts, by the way, are not hard. They're just not explained well to the general public. And from that standpoint, I think this reference I've given to the right, our book chapter from uh, uh, the book Indian Insects, that chapter actually describes all these things really nicely with figures. There's a figure to describe clients and there are two kinds of clients, linear clients and uh, step clients. So it describes both those clients and mentions what are the Indian landscapes where you might expect that kind of uh, clients. So it has a lot of interesting material which, and I've heard from people who have read that, that it was very useful to them. So if you're an amateur or if you're a student who hopes to do a career in butterfly biology, read these things It will uh, bring up to speed. And then of course, from that, you can go to the next level of actually doing things. But understanding is the first part. Discovering is the next part. Um, 
And then of course, after you have discoveries of let's say new species, you still need to study the specimens and write a good paper. And for that, again, you need training. So that's the sort of work we need to do. And that is the part I've covered under inspect. And the last thing that I've sequenced, that is something that only one place in India can do right now, given the resources for molecular sequencing. And of course, the understanding of butterfly taxonomy and systematics, which is my lab. Again, there are several other labs which could potentially do this, but we need to uh, uh, learn how to do this well before we can do this. Our uh, paper on uh, Caraxes subgenus polyura, for example, has come from that kind of uh, uh, kind of work. And there will be several papers. In fact, we are submitting one on uh, uh, swallowtail butterflies, which will uh, uh, reveal quite a few surprises. Uh, and that will happen um, probably uh, fairly soon. But this is the kind of work for which you will have to come to my lab to do this. We are part of a larger group called Butterfly Net. It's an international uh, uh, project uh, funded by the US National Science Foundation. And I'm the um, India representative of that. The, there's a, this international collaboration which is uh, doing this. And we are doing sequencing as part of that big collaboration in addition to, of course, what my lab does. So what does that, what is that feel? If you're familiar with it, sure, you can just understand what we are trying to do for others. I'll describe this a little bit. Oh, I also noticed that it's 8.50, so actually I need to wrap up. I didn't realize it was uh, this time. Okay, so this is basically you do sequencing, you use the sequences to build a phylogeny, which is a species tree of uh, that particular group. And from that, using some phylogenetic methods, you uh, delimit species based on the data. And, um, that is what uh, we have been doing. And this is slightly more involved. So I won't go into the details of this, but I'll, I'll uh, re refresh your memory of what I said earlier, that a lot of modern systematic and taxonomic work is based on what is done here, yeah? using molecular uh, sequencing and phylogenetic uh, analysis. So this is something that's going to change a lot of things. Polyura to uh, synonymy with Caraxes was based on this. Uh, splitting of uh, lysinidae and riodinidae. Of course, there's uh, morphological evidence to separate those two families, but for a long time, riodinidae was considered a subfamily of uh, uh, lysinidae until 20, 30 years ago, but now these are considered two distinct families, no problem. The surprising things were the fact that, for example, Hesperidae is not a link between moths and butterflies. In fact, moths and butterflies are not two different things. Butterflies are moths. That revelation has come from phylogenetic studies, molecular phylogenetics. The fact that uh, swallowtail butterflies are the most ancient butterflies has come from molecular systematics. The fact that the moth butterflies, uh, Hedylidae, is part of butterflies and not a separate superfamily, that understanding has come from molecular phylogenetics. So this tremendous amount of information that is coming out of molecular phylogenetics which is fundamentally, under, uh, fundamentally changing our understanding of butterfly systematics. I mean, if you have to change families and subfamilies and genera because of this work, those are consequential studies. And this is unfortunately the kind of work that traditional morphology-based or genitalia-based taxonomy cannot do. The genomes offer way more data than uh, the genitalia structures can offer because every sequence that you choose carefully from the whole genome is going to give you independent evidence of the evolutionary history of that particular taxon. And that gives you the sort of independent verification at the genome level that morphology just cannot offer. So if you, again, morphology is still important. I myself have described species based purely on morphology, but a lot of important taxonomic decisions, especially regarding genera, subfamilies and families, as well as many of the species groups are going to be taken up based on uh, molecular sequencing. So that is the last part, the sequencing part. And I should probably give a separate talk about that sometime, perhaps after our paper on swallowtails and a couple of other papers come out, I might do that. Okay, so that is uh, 
would have mentioned on top as uh, biodiversity labs mantra to modernize uh, uh, the framework for uh, studying the biology of Indian butterflies as well as upgrading the taxonomic and uh, systematic understanding of Indian butterflies. So I will not actually spend too much time on the rest of the things, but I will mention that a big growth in butterfly biology uh, as well as citizen science is what we are doing through the research collections as well as the Butterflies of India website. And we are facilitating cutting edge research in field biology with field stations, with research collections. And of course, this has led to uh, fairly substantial collections with which, for example, we were able to describe uh, a banded tit, uh, the butterfly species from uh, Namda area. We have described several moths, uh, the one from, again, Arunachal near uh, from Tale uh, Wildlife Sanctuary, described by Sanjay, Sundi, and uh, uh, the rest of us, is the latest uh, taxonomy in, uh, taxonomic discovery in butterflies and moths that we have done. And these are sorts of things which have been facilitated by all the uh, taxonomic work which is possible because of the specimens that we have. And uh, everything that we have done is georeference data, and we have deep frozen DNA libraries uh, preserved in minus 40 and minus 80 degrees uh, freezers associated with every single species that we have collected. So that is phenomenal. And look at the quality of the specimens that we have. Compare it with absolutely any other museum in India. And you will see that we are following the protocols in line with what, let's say, what Natural History Museum is doing, what Magua Center is doing, what Smithsonian is doing, what uh, the Natural History Museum in Paris is doing, or several museums in Germany and elsewhere are doing. So because of my training in uh, uh, systematics, phylogenetic uh, systematics, as well as, of course, basic uh, morphological taxonomy, we have been able to uh, grow this collection at the same uh, level of uh, value as some of these big museums, many of which we have uh, MOUs with. And in fact, the curation protocol that we use is the same one that uh, our Natural History Museum London uses. Those folks have been incredibly supportive of what we've been doing here. And we have been able to completely change how collections and curation are done because of this uh, uh, exposure to what modern museums are and of course, what uh, curation protocols are. And of course, the most important um, collections that we have raised are these type specimens of more than 50 species, actually 30, 57 species, if I correctly remember by now, or maybe even 60, of everything from reptiles and amphibians to fish and crabs, and of course, Lepidoptera, but, and of course, cicadas. We have described uh, three species of cicadas so far, and we are describing several more. Uh, Odoneta, we have described several species. So, we are just expanding, we are supporting all kinds of entomological work, both on our own, as well as in collaboration with other good museums and taxonomists in India. So we really need, are trying to build this network within India where a lot of good work is possible in collaboration, which is how most of the Western scientific powerhouses and other things have uh, become available. Yeah, great. So with that, I will stop and I, as I mentioned, I did not realize that I had uh, gone over one hour. Uh, I don't know how many people are still there. Or oh, 63 participants are still there, not bad. But I'll stop there. I will give the presentation to uh, um, Oh, there's one more thing. Just a minute, I'll share that with you guys. Since there's still, I'll just take people five more minutes so that I do not miss any of the important things that we want to talk about. And if you're still interested about this, you can take some questions. I don't want to miss this. And of course, we, you can ask these questions later as well. Uh, this is not going to end just with this. Okay, I will share the screen once again. Okay.
Oh, you're seeing a different screen now. Let me just switch this off and see what happens. Okay, I think now you see just the, uh, no, you're still seeing the whole thing. Let me just see what I can do. Mm. Presenter tools, I'll disable and hopefully it will do this. Okay, so um, um, these are the sorts of images that we have taken from NHM. These are the labels on the actual specimens. But if you have been following uh, one of my discoveries, of course, you know, uh, uh, botanicals, blood library specimens are collected from the Russian Valley. So you see that label uh, there. So these are the original type specimens from which these uh, the species was described. And of course, uh, uh, Atima Whitey, you might know about. And uh, um, uh, this is the sort of resources that we have built. And what we are now uh, uh, doing is um, using all of this to um, in all our taxonomic studies. Biology, I sort of talked about it last time, so I won't speak too much about biology but uh, this is the overall framework that we are really pushing for uh, the um, observe collect inspect and sequence uh, mantra that i mentioned so um, with that i will stop actually since it's so late and since there's still a lot of people let's see if anybody has questions and uh, uh, then we'll uh, wrap this up yeah Thanks a lot for everyone again for sticking around. I, I'm sorry I did not realize it's been two hours since we started. I just 10 minutes ago, 15 minutes ago, I realized what time it was. But uh, I'm glad that you stuck around anyway. And of course, um, uh, this discussion will continue. It's not going to end tonight uh, because we all need to start working and uh, doing work so that we have better understanding of Indian butterflies with data and with evidence rather than, you know, I just thought this is here and sort of there. And I've just laid out sort of vision of scientifically where we need to be, irrespective of, as I mentioned, whether you're an amateur or a professional scientist. So um, that is that. Okay. Yes, Kishimak sir. So uh, thank you so much, Kishimak sir, for such a wonderful and elaborate session on this particular and also the most wanted topic. Uh, science never gets boring, as everyone says, and you made us realize how much we are lagging in our particular studies. I personally learned and came to know a lot of things for the very first time. I'm really awestruck. And today we have uh, we have a lot of questions that have come up in the chat window. I'll just read it out to you uh, one mm -hmm. by one. Uh, just give me a minute, so. so I'll just mention this yeah, one question that I see right away, which is that uh, what about cDNA library has the butterfly genome sequence fully and so on and so forth. So yes, but several butterfly genomes 
including our common Mormon common species has been sequenced. Uh, the entire genome is available, and uh, this the entire genome was initially done by a Japanese group. And my lab has now done more than uh, 40 genomes from the Indian population, and more than 200 transcriptomes from uh, again the Indian population from all different female forms. So uh, the genetic resources on Papliopolitus, uh, common Mormon, are awesome at this point. But several other species are being uh, um, uh, are being sequenced or have been sequenced, and those sequences are being made available. So that is something that's uh, being done. And let's see what other messages I have. Uh, Sharon, you can also read them out to me or Sohail. Like yes, sir, I'll, I'll read it out to you. So the first question is from uh, Anita Chauhan, this is in Facebook. So she said, which book is it uh, where you mentioned Punte et al. 2019? Where can I get that? Okay. Um, actually, an e-book of this is also available. Uh, and I think it's available on Amazon. Oh, sir, we can't hear you. you uh, if not on Amazon, you can look up uh, where that book is available, uh, electronic copy. But for example, uh, oh, before that, I'll tell you what that is. So the book chapter is called Taxonomy, Systematics, and Biology of Indian Butterflies in the 21st Century. This was uh, written up by uh, uh, myself, Dipendranath Basu, and G.S. Girish Kumar, two of my students. And most of the figures regarding taxonomy and the history of taxonomic discovery and the genitalia I showed were uh, from that. And this chapter was published in the book called Indian Insects, Diversity, and Science. This was edited by S. Uh, uh, Ramani P. Mohanraj and H. M. Yashwan, three editors. Um, uh, P. Mohanraj uh, retired several years ago from NBAR in uh, Bangalore. And um, uh, Ramani sir and uh, Yashwan are two faculty members in the University of Agricultural Sciences. So if you look around uh, in places like, let's say, uh, ResearchGate, this book chapter is available. The, it may be available in other places as well. Just look up. Uh, so you will be able to find the PDF file of this or the uh, ebook of the entire thing. And there are lots of really interesting, really useful chapters in this. The kind of taxonomic overview of uh, uh, modern uh, developments in systematics as well as traditional taxonomy that I did, those things are not available in any other chapters. But at least uh, for butterflies, I have tried to know that in this chapter. So it's actually historically uh, quite a nice uh, overview of what is known and what people have done. So uh, I'll read that. Um, that book will be if you actually go to my lab website, biodiversitylab.org, you will see the entire citation. This was published last year, November or October, uh, something like that. Uh, so that chap book chapter is listed on my lab website under uh, publications, and you can uh, uh, read this chapter. It will help you a lot. Uh, when at what level you are, doesn't matter whether you're a student who has never really done anything about butterflies or never really thought about butterflies. Two people who have actually done some work on butterflies, many of you might have published nationalist papers or maybe discovered uh, a butterfly somewhere it's not supposed to be, a range extension, whether you might have done that kind of work, it will still be quite a useful read to you because it gives this historical perspective on how butterfly taxonomy and butterfly species discovery started in India but where the rest of the world has moved to. As I mentioned, the species concept, the subspecies concepts. In the book chapter, I have actually listed the most popular species concepts in evolutionary biology, which are, which are what are used in taxonomy as well. So evolutionary biology is not an unrelated field which has no relevance to taxonomy. In fact, taxonomy has enriched uh, evolutionary biology historically, and now evolutionary biology is uh, guiding a lot of taxonomic work, especially high level taxonomy. What are genera, what are subspecies, families, subfamilies, I mean, superfamilies and so on. Oh, by the way, one of the discoveries from molecular systematics, for example, historically, you know that skippers were in their own superfamily, Hesperioidea, huh? and then rest of the butterflies, the other uh, uh, six, families, including now uh, moth butterflies, 
Hedylidae. Uh, but before Hedylidae was merged, the remaining five families of butterflies were put under Papilionoidea. Yeah, so that was the super family. So butterflies, keepers and rest of the butterflies were in two super families. Now they're all in one super family, uh, uh, which has all the butterflies, including moth butterflies now. So Hesperidae is, has, does not have its own super family. Hedylidae does not have its own super family. Those are both uh, families under super family uh, Papilionoidea, which has everything, all two butterflies under it. So this sort of things are explained in that book chapter, along with references uh, through which this has been scientifically settled. Whether we know it or not doesn't matter uh, in some sense, but scientifically it has been settled and all these references are given there. If I remember correctly, this book chapter uh, has something like seven pages of uh, references in a large format and the chapter itself is 30 pages long. Yeah? So, it's a fairly substantial chapter which summarizes a lot of things really nicely. So read that and you will benefit from that quite a lot. Okay, the next question. The next question is from Sangeeta Jain. So she's asking, can people who are from different disciplines, uh, like for example, commerce, but seriously want to study butterflies, mm -hmm. get formal training, uh, like involved in projects or formal studies? If so, how? It's more difficult. Last time we had this, uh, we uh, last time we had a webinar, uh, we talked about um, Butterflies of India website. Yeah. So, and all the things that it does. And at that, oh wait, uh, not that one. The one we just had a few days ago, which Nature Mates had organized and there uh, I answered questions about how to make a career studying butterflies. So at that time I said that you're not bound by your background. I said engineering, no problem, chemistry, physics, maths, no problem, or anything else. In India, unfortunately, if you want to do a career, oh, by the way, by studying butterflies uh, and making a career, I meant anybody who discovers important things and studies them seriously is a butterfly biologist in my mind. So if you are a commerce student and do really good work, as far as I'm concerned, you're a butterfly biologist with tremendous contributions to um, uh, Indian butterfly bite. But if you want to uh, oh, all right. So if you are looking for, uh, for example, making a professional career, meaning that you are actually going to get salary for the things that you do, that is going to be difficult if you are a commerce student, simply because India just does not allow uh, switches between these different fields. If you have done commerce, if you have done arts, you cannot go into a science program. If you have done engineering, you cannot go into a master's program in uh, zoology, for example. If you have done uh, biology, you cannot do an engineering degree and so on and so forth. So it's difficult, but if you have experience, some research experience, and of course, if you have a burning desire to do something in this field, you can go abroad. If you are a commerce student, if you are an engineering student who cannot get admission in India, just apply abroad. Abroad, it doesn't matter what your educational background is, including higher degrees. What matters is, are you going to be a good uh, PhD student or a master student, a student for that matter? And if you do have that, then of course you can uh, get into a PhD program and you can do a career. Unfortunately, if you want to come back to India and get a professor job in a research institute, for example, I'll have to see actually in a biology institute, I don't know whether you can get a job if you are a commerce bachelor's and master's and then did a PhD abroad. If you have done engineering or any of the sciences, physics, math, chemistry, biology, and done a PhD in biology, you can get a, a biology department uh, professor in India. But if you are a commerce or art student, your bachelor's and master's are from those areas, and you have a higher degree in, uh, uh, let's say, a PhD in uh, biology, I don't know whether you can get a faculty position in India in a biology department, because when you join, you'll be asked certificates all the way from 10th grade or something. So if you don't have the required degree certificates from the degrees that are expected, you may still uh, have a problem. But I'm not sure about that. We check. <laughs> so, um, 
Um, unfortunately, in this case, I cannot have a clear answer. But any other kind of science degree, I'm pretty sure you will be able to, uh, to get a biology a PhD and then a faculty position. But that's about uh, a faculty kind of a position. If you want to get, uh, let's say, go into conservation and conservation research, you could, for example, work with WWF or Conservation International or um, what are the other conservation research groups that I can imagine. Um, actually, nothing else comes to my mind right now for butterfly studies. But in India, for example, several NGOs are doing really well. I mentioned Nature Mates last time. They have a fairly nice group which uh, does some uh, research on Indian butterflies. And we have several collaborations as well with Sarika and others uh, in that group. So with these things, we um, you have opportunities to get into research. Even if not in an academic uh, position in a university or research institute, you could do other things for sure. Okay. Next question. So the next question is from Ekata. Uh, the text goes like this. So, hi, I am doing research on correlation of butterfly structures and its coloration. Mm -hmm. I want to know how to get specimens for my research from various parts of India. Say, for example, Baksa Tiger Reserve is very diverse regarding especially iridescent butterflies. How mm -hmm. to get these specimens, whom to contact, kindly guide. I, I answered that earlier. Uh, Ekta, hi, by the way. Uh, nice that you're attending this. I think I noticed that you were uh, there at the uh, Nature Mates uh, webinar as well. So, um, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, getting permits is very hard. The forest department ideally likes to see some uh, proper affiliation with an academic institution or with places like ZSI. Uh, so if you are affiliated with some uh, proper academic institution, Pune University, for example, is good enough, uh, or even modern college uh, was good enough to get permits, I suppose, uh, for uh, 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 Professor Gatte. So you need to have some affiliation that you can use. Forest department, will almost guaranteed not give you permission to collect if you do not have a formal affiliation with some agency which does research, either whether it's NGO or a research institution or a government agency like ZSI or FRI, doesn't matter, but you will need that affiliation. You will need a good proposal, a good reason why you want to collect before you can collect those. We have legitimate reasons to collect even scheduled species so that we get permits to do that. And of course, scheduled species, only one or two can be collected. Others can be collected a little bit more. But if you give a good reason why you want to collect, and if you have the proper affiliation, Forest Department will entertain your request for collection. And of course, if you are collecting non-scheduled species from other places, you may be able to collect uh, in several other ways uh, from private land, for example, or if you are a university campus, from university, uh, of course, entomological collections can be made. For example, every university and college has this kind of zoological collections. But for uh, forest land and for uh, um, uh, scheduled species, you will need to get permission from forest department. You mentioned Baksa Tiger Reserve. It's a tiger reserve and a national park. You will have to get permission from the uh, West Bengal Forest Department. So the next question is from Monica Gandhi. The question is, how often is it necessary to perform genitalia dissections on species at a location? Wouldn't evolution affect in formation of new species gradually with time in a given location due to various environmental factors? Absolutely. So uh, again, read that book chapter. <laughs> I will go back to that again and again and again because we have put tremendous amount of material. This is 30 pages of printed material. I think some 24 pages of actual text and the last seven pages or so is references, as I mentioned. Uh, but I have uh, given preliminary introductory text about what are species, uh, about isolation, about diversification and things like that, about clients and variation. So you will learn a lot of these things from there. But uh, since some of you clearly do not uh, have that background or have not read the chapter, I'll mention that you're thinking it's spot on. Yes, locally, there should be divergence from other populations in other areas where the species
versions, potentially random, what we call drift, or under selection, for example, the temperature and humidity regimes may be different, the predators may be different, uh, the height of the vegetation may be different. There could be a number of reasons why there's different kind of selection pressure, either predation or selection for um, thermoregulation and things like that. So based on uh, the ecological pressures that butterflies are facing, you will get either random drift or uh, selection driving these populations to be different. And genitalia along with wing patterns and behaviors and physiology even will change based on these uh, different selection pressures. Now your question, uh, should we not do genitalia dissections of local populations? That's not necessary. For example, if the selection is on temperature uh, uh, management, thermoregulation, uh, basking behavior and other things might be under selection rather than genitalia because there's no reason why genitalia should change. So if there's some movement across different areas, for example, uh, elevational climb in uh, the Himalaya, so if these things are changing, then maybe thermoregulatory behavior as well as thermoregulatory phenotype, the melanization of the wings, which is what my student Shubham showed, for example, that will change, but there's no reason why the genetical identity of different subpopulations should change and or why uh, should genitalia change. But if there's selection for reproductive isolation, for example, for whatever reason, again, that might happen either uh, uh, due to some selection or uh, it might just, there won't be selection for genetic, uh, for reproductive isolation, but reproductive isolation might just happen because two populations have remained isolated for too long. Let's say Andaman Islands and uh, mainland India, for example. So in those cases, even genitalia will uh, change either under drift or under selection. But in most cases, unless you suspect that there's some major biogeographic barrier because of which you suspect that, let's say Western Ghats and Northeast Indian populations versus Andamanese populations, uh, may, might be different species, there's no reason to suspect that genitalia might differ. So if you understand biology, if you understand evolutionary biology, behavior, biogeography a little bit, then you might be able to guess which populations might be interesting to study. Now, if you want to use brute force approach, dissect every single population that you can find and define, uh, and then dissect uh, butterfly genitalia, find every population, take several individuals, from that population and then do sequencing to see whether genetic differences exist. You could do that. That is going to cost you crores upon crores of rupees and decade upon decade of work. But if you're just going to use a brute force, a lot of this work is going to lead to no understanding. No understanding that's interesting. Uh, a lot of the subpopulations or what you might think are two different populations might just turn out to be one large population where individuals just move uh, around all the time and therefore the whole population is homogenized. Whereas if you look for biogeographic barriers and then look on the two other, two different sites of the biogeographic barrier, for example, Bay of Bengal is a biogeographic barrier to movement uh, of butterflies. Then you could look at Andamans and mainland, for example, and a lot of species and subspecies, for example, have been identified from Andamans for this reason. Or if you look at, let's say, um, uh, Palghat Gap, for a lot of organisms, that is a real biogeographic barrier, and north of south of which a lot of species are endemic. In butterflies, there are few examples, not enough uh, compared to, let's say, uh, dragonflies or uh, uh, amphibians and so on. You will see that uh, Palghat Gap is a much bigger biogeographic barrier for those organisms than, let's say, butterflies. But we do have a few examples where North and South of Palghat Gap, you see different populations that you might want to call either subspecies or species, depending on how much divergence they show. By the way, here is another pretty stunning um, revelation from evolutionary biology. There's a continuum from populations to subspecies to species, or what some people have called super species as well, beyond species. Where you draw a line between species and subspecies and populations really depends on how many differences do you know. 
and that is one of the problems in india we just haven't studied differences enough both variation within populations and variations across populations which define where you will draw a line between these things so if your variation within a population is bigger than what have been defined as subspecies or species which is the case of plains cupid that i mentioned then you cannot define those as subspecies or even species for that matter but if you have variation within populations which is smaller than the variation that you see across populations for example if you look at wing patterns if you look at genetic variations if you look at body size if you look at thermal tolerance if you look at host plant use you can take any biological parameters and look at clustering of uh, different individuals within populations across populations what you should ideally see is if you look at variation within one population that variation imagine that this uh, a circular space that i have a round space that i have just created here any individual uh, variation that you see within that space this is for example a phenotype space any individual will represent a spot in that space and the population on the whole is uh, representing that variation yeah so the variation within a population should be smaller than the variation across populations so if this is now a second population which again has some variation it may be more variation compared to this or smaller variation compared to this but the variation across these two populations if it's greater and for example some of this variation that you see is about wing patterns then taxonomically you could treat that as a subspecies but if the variation is like this what you are calling two populations is really a lot of overlap between the two populations and only part of the variation that you see across populations is not shared then you have to judge how important is that variation to define those two populations as subspecies and uh, ideally for species you could have multiple subpopulations and multiple subspecies if people have studied variation enough but then there has to be this logic that variation within a population is more than variation across populations to call something a subspecies and if there is reproductive isolation between these uh, different groups of populations then you will call that a species so in modern biology in taxonomy as well as evolution biology and phylogenetics a species is defined as something a group of populations which has a cohesive uh, structure whether you define that structure as morphological variation or as genetic variation but a population a set of populations has to have a cohesive structure which is separate from other uh, such structures other such clusters that is defined as a species and uh, all modern biologists believe that that structure comes from some level of reproductive isolation whether that reproductive isolation comes from selection or drift and how much of it is there is where a lot of uh, confusion is and that is where the a lot of gray area is so if you don't have enough variation across populations but there's some you can define some will you then call that different species or subspecies that is where the gray area is but it's not a gray area because we don't understand it's a gray area precisely because we understand and the confusion or rather the disagreement the gray area among biologists comes because some biologists might think that these five uh, traits that are known to be different across these populations is good enough to satisfy me to call it different subspecies and at a different level different species somebody else might say that this uh, these characters are not good enough to define a species or subspecies so they might want to uh, treat these different clusters of populations as the same subspecies or the same species but understand that this gray area so if you consider that here is one population let's say my arm is one large population which is now splitting let's say one is on island and the other one continues to be on mainland for example so because the island population is separated and this is again beautifully illustrated in that book chapter because the island and mainland populations are now separated 
either because of random drift or because of selection, these two populations are going to start growing, uh, increasing differences between them. Yeah. So from one population, which is what this is, to two populations, where do you draw a line? Do you draw a line when there's only one character which is, which is different? Do you draw a line when there are five different characters? Do you draw a line when there are 100 different characters? So different biologists, depending on what they know about the populations and uh, which characters they deem more important, just like in taxonomy, for example, for some group, people thought that claspers were more important and others, they thought that Ediagus, the uh, penis equivalent in insect, it's called Ediagus. The shape of Ediagus was more important. For example, the class Pananthus does not differ between Arionota torus and Arionota thrax, the rounded uh, uh, palm red eye, which is uh, torus, and then acute palm red eye, which is uh, thrax. But Evans actually described the, subs uh, the species torus, and he differentiated between those two species based on the shape, the width uh, of uh, Ediagus. Yeah, he did not use claspers for that, the valve for that. So depending on what taxonomists believe is important to distinguish between species, evolutionary biologists and phylogenetists may think that that many characters is good enough to define something as species. But that is because there's evolution happening. You could imagine that, for example, Northern and Southern Western Ghats, there's some diversification. Uh, Western Ghats and Andaman Islands, there's going to be more diversification. And these two populations versus, let's say, something in Borneo is going to be even more uh, uh, diversified, right? So we are talking about where at this level of diversification are we drawing a line? And because that gradation itself is a gray area, people are going to disagree about where that population lies along that gray area. So if we say, for example, that something is a species or subspecies, it is going to be that gray area that we cannot really deal with. And a good biologist who understands that biology is gray because there's evolution happening. If it was something like, let's say, materials that we produce, you either produce a hose, or you produce a, a tap, or you produce a computer, or you produce a table. Yeah? You know what to call that because you've defined it. And once you make a table, that remains a table. Yeah? A table does not transform into a computer. Whereas that is precisely what biological systems do. What might be a bacterium or bacterium like prokaryote might turn into something as complex as an elephant, right? So because this evolution is happening, because this diversification, you cannot sometimes define things because those populations may be in this gray zone. Yeah. So this is again one point I would like to do, especially considering what I've recently heard from several people. And this is something, this is not my thought. I'm just uh, uh, recalling it right now, given what I've heard recently. A true mark of a scientist who knows is how much of a gray zone, how much of a lack of understanding or firmness that he or she is willing to acknowledge. If you understand biology really well, if you understand species really well, you will have no problem saying that you could either treat something as a subspecies or as species does not matter. I understand your opinion. You understand my opinion of where we stand. When you write a paper, you call that a subspecies and give your reasons. I will call that a species and I'll give my reasons. And then of course, you can decide. But if you say that, no, this is a species and how dare you use that as a subspecies or as a synonym, or I think these are two subspecies and how dare you call that a species, which is what somebody who does not understand biology enough will do that is where uh, the uh, problem is. If we have a scientific understanding, if you have enough information to understand where the gray zone comes from, then there's no problem. If you're dogmatic about drawing a line without really having an understanding, that is where the problem is. And some of the taxonomists and taxonomical works that I've criticized, uh, our checklist that people have made comes from that that you say this is the draw line I've drawn without giving any evidence uh, in fact, and say everybody else has to follow it. Otherwise, I'm going to attack you on Facebook or on WhatsApp. That is a hallmark uh, of a person who has not learned enough. 
Yeah. So where we want to go with this whole understanding, both in taxonomy and evolutionary biology. Oh, by the way, this understanding, this dichotomous uh, diversification, and sometimes non-dichotomous diversification. For example, when species split from a population split, not from one population to two, but from one to many, more than two. Uh, and that is called uh, uh, species radiation, for example, adaptive radiation. Uh, and that can happen. So uh, those are the kinds of situations when these gray areas become even more and more uh, problematic. And when biologists actually understand those, they have absolutely no problem uh, acknowledging this. But that understanding has not come so much from taxonomy. It has come from more from evolutionary biology. And taxonomists, uh, starting from Ernst Meyer, who wrote a lot about this, have hammered these concepts into pretty good shape that all modern biologists, whether they're taxonomists or evolutionary biologists, understand these really well. But the taxonomic uh, decision on whether something should be called a species or subspecies has come from this evolutionary understanding that populations might be at a point where it's difficult to uh, draw a line. So the idea of a subspecies actually came from that whole gray area that you see a few differences between populations, but they're not large enough to be called uh, species. And therefore people, uh, taxonomists and evolution biologists came up with that idea of calling these slightly differentiated populations subspecies. And when it became apparent that sometimes some populations might be reproductively isolated and therefore you might want to call them different species, but then some populations within that larger area may not be isolated enough. Or if you have populations, let's say A, B, C, D, E, populations A and E may be reproductively isolated, but populations A and B or E and B may not be reproductively isolated. In which case, biologists have come up with more complicated and more slippery ideas like, let's say, superspecies. Superspecies is an interesting idea where you say something which is perhaps a cluster of species which is uh, diverging or something like that. So as evolutionary biologists, they understand what is happening in diversification within this group. But taxonomically, there is no standing for a superspecies. You cannot name a taxonomically valid superspecies. You can only name species and subspecies. Yeah? So there's still some uh, distance between evolution biology and taxonomy precisely for their goals. But, the, but a lot of understanding of divergence and reproductive isolation uh, and then subsequent speciation is shared between these two groups. And that's again something that a lot of uh, people who go around India calling themselves taxonomists, and you know who I'm talking about, do not understand. But we really need to uh, get behind get past that and see for complicated things like, let's say, Halpe, where drawing lines is easy because genitalia are distinct enough. But then you go to something like, let's say, um, some of the neptis, some of the sailors that I mentioned, or uh, 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 what other groups can I think of where there is uh, still some uncertainty about uh, whether we can draw a species line or not. And for Butterflies of India website, for example, several populations, we have decided to call them different species because there are enough differences between them. There's enough biological basis to interpret those differences as ecologically relevant and reproductively relevant to call them species. For others, who knows? So then there will be a note there saying that we are uh, tentatively treating it as species, but genitalia really need to be dissected and confirmed or sequencing need to be done, phylogenetic studies need to be done. So this is where we need to go from having enough understanding to make a call in clear cases and having enough understanding to identify which groups represent these gray areas and what do we need to do to sort these gray areas out. For example, in some cases, gray areas may be sorted out enough that you can decide what's a species and what is not. But in some cases, gray areas are true. Biologically, they're true. So gray areas may not necessarily be because of our lack of understanding. It could really be that in this divergence, you're right here or right here. 
where you cannot really say there are enough differences. So what are biologically relevant gray areas and what are informationally uh, gray areas that we can sort out? There uh, is where we need to go as a community, as a community of butterfly biologists, butterfly taxonomists, butterfly naturalists, because that's just going to make biology more interesting. Yeah, If we know information rather than just say that I'm going to call this a species or a subspecies, or I'm going to say that this butterfly only has one generation per year versus something has multiple generation. And because in my area it has one generation, everybody has to agree that it has one generation all over India. One of the burning problems, nobody talks about this. So I would like to have discussions and debates in Facebook and WhatsApp, for example, about how many generations does Bhutan Jodi have in India? Have you heard that uh, argument? Have you heard any uh, notes being exchanged? Any of these groups? No. Is there data from in any journals which say that, let's say, uh, Arunachal, Western Arunachal Pradesh, Eagle Nest, how many generations do you see? There are no data. In uh, Khasi Hills, how many generations do you see? In Nagaland, in Manipur, I mean, uh, Manipur, yes. How many do you see? So if you look at uh, uh, different older books and papers. For example, several have uh, mentioned that Bhutan glories were collected from, let's say, May to something like October. Uh, in some other cases, I'll have to recall which uh, examples this is, but some of these Himalayan and uh, Northeastern hill uh, species, the flight period has been given from April to November, things like that. But if you go to Eagle Nest, they occur only in one month or one and a half months. But for a species like Bhutan glory, that is one generation. That's not multiple generations. Yeah. So in Eagle Nest area, now with observations that Tarun and Sarika and others have taken in our group, we do know that in uh, uh, Eagle Nest area, there's a single generation. It occurs from end of July in a good year to uh, um, sometimes early October. Yeah. The peak is really in part of August and part of September. So about mid-August to mid-September is really when the peak is, right? Similarly, Bhutan, it is uh, uh, Ladlavi, the mystical Bhutan glory. There is, a one, there is a single generation and it starts and ends a little bit before uh, our common Bhutan glory. Yeah? So these are things that we know now because of observations. Is there anybody in Arunachal elsewhere who will tell you how many generations they have seen based on how many butterflies they have seen. If you ask Tarun, what is this uh, flight period that I just mentioned? What is this based on? He will produce you numbers. He will tell you in over these three years from July to October, this is the number of butterflies we counted. Now we have data to show how many generations there are. Is there data from Mizoram? Is there data from Nagaland, from Manipur, from uh, Arunachal, other parts of Arunachal? No, that is where we need to go. If you want to have a Facebook fight, fight about how much data you have and what it says. Yeah. So I completely forgot what your question was. <laughs> <laughs> So, so uh, we'll take uh, uh, three to four questions sir, before we end due to the time. Just, constraints. just a minute. Can you please remind me what the question was? I would like to summarize in one sentence. Uh, I have to go back. Uh, so, how often is it necessary to perform genetic dissections on species ah. at a location? So Wouldn't evolutionary good, affect? Uh, good, good, good. I went through species concepts, what it means to have divergence, and what it means to have gray area. So to summarize my answer, you need to have data to understand whether local uh, dissections or sequencing from local areas is important or not. And that understanding will come when you have this sort of information. So that's the short answer. But to understand that short answer, I needed all this background without that you wouldn't understand. So for example, if you actually, I said I will summarize, but I just thought of one interesting aspect to what I just mentioned. For example, if you see that, let's say the Western uh, Himalayan populations, I mean, uh, the Western Arunachal populations of Bhutan glory fly only in August and September. It will not fly in any other season. And let's say hypothetically, there's another mountain range somewhere else. 
which flies only in February, March. There's no way those two populations are ever going to meet. Even if butterflies from one area go to another uh, population, they're not going to find mates in that area. So even if once in a while there is migration between those two populations, there is no way those two populations are ever going to mix and produce fertile offspring and therefore remain uh, maintain a genetic identity. So if you have this sort of biological information, then that is where you say, I'll go to this February, March population and see whether they have unique genetic uh, identity and whether they'll have unique uh, uh, larval characters or genital characters. But if everything is same, they fly at the same time, they don't have any other morphological features that are different, or at least not large enough to suspect that something else, those small differences might be reflective of something larger. Then there's no point in trying to dissect everywhere because first you have to get permission, collect specimens, then dissect. But if you want to know a different question, for example, are uh, Arunachal populations and Khasi Hills populations different? Because those two populations are separated by the Assam Valley in which Bhutan glory does not occur. How did it get across the Assam Valley? We don't know. When did it, uh, when, when did it get across? How many millions of years ago? That you can find out based on genetic uh, diversification. If you want to know how much genetic diversity there is in different populations of, let's say, golden bird wing in Western Himalaya versus Eastern Himalaya, across the entire uh, line of Western to Eastern Himalaya, there you may not see any morphological differences, but you will surely see some genetic differences. So based on your question, local populations, investing local populations and their variation may be important, not in other cases. All right, next question. Uh, so we'll take a couple of questions from Anita Chauhan. The first question is, how many species are controversial like the Halpe? And the mm -hmm. second question from her is, why do researchers collect specimen during surveys if they are taking digital photos as well? So Halpe, you can't investigate genitalia from them, right? Photos are good only for certain things. So in Butterflies of India, for example, we make a big deal of the variation that is seen. If you remember the second uh, webinar that I conducted, uh, which was on Butterflies of India website, how to contribute and so on, I told you that we have this big team of research uh, of reviewers, uh, experienced naturalists who help us uh, curate all the images that are submitted. For example, we try to identify male and female, dry season, wet season form, aberration, all manner of variation that can be defined. So we do that precisely to elevate the understanding of those populations and species and uh, subspecies and species across the entire uh, mosaic of habitats across India. So photographs can do a lot, but photographs are not good enough for scientific work, uh, or at least not all kind of scientific work. For example, I have studied uh, the three female forms of uh, Papilopolitus. Can you tell me from photographs how much diverged they are? Can you tell me from photographs when did they diverge? I can put a date on when the first form arose in Papilopolitus to when the last form arose. So my uh, second uh, thing, other PhD student, Riddhi, is writing a fabulous paper on, uh, uh, on this kind of genetic data. You cannot get those from uh, 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 images. So images are good enough for certain kind of things. Images are good enough if you're an amateur. But if you are the kind of scientist who does uh, advanced evolutionary or paleolithic work, we do need specimens because we need materials, for example, genitalia or genetic sequences, which you cannot get from uh, either digital images or even a small fraction. You can't just get a leg and hope that that is going to be enough. For his spirits, for example, you might get a leg and you will be able to sequence. But if that sequence turns out to be very different from other species that are known, how are you going to find out whether that was a different species or whether there's contamination or something else? If you look closely, you might find differences that are consistent between the specimen that you caught versus others. So depending on the rigor at which you are working, you will need specimens of these things. Um, and of course, if something is much larger, let's say you have a clouded leopard at hand, you can take enough images and take, take enough DNA that you can confirm, for example, that there was no contamination when you did sequencing because you have more material. For other things like, let's say, a drosophila, it's such a tiny 
fly. You cannot hope to do this from a single leg, taxonomic work from a single leg. So the question that you asked is a common question that I get mostly from amateurs and those who have been told that, you know, collecting is bad. Collecting is bad in the sense that it should not be done indiscriminately. If you could do with a single specimen, then of course you should not collect 10 specimens. But if you have to collect 100 specimens for something, then you have to collect it. Of course, then you don't want it to be a scheduled species. But for a common species like, let's say, Melanitis leda, if you consider how many butterflies are produced, 100 for you might be a shocking number. But the population of the butterfly is several million butterflies, right? So 100 is really not a whole lot. Then you have to decide how much information that we are getting, which might help to, let's say, uh, decide whether something is one species or 10, and how much information we can get, for example, on genetic identity of every population. So in conservation biology, the unique populations is something that you want to protect much more than, let's say, similar populations in two areas because that unique population represents a unique history of that species, which might be important for the species, long-term uh, survival of the species. So if you want to know that, again, you need good genetic material. So 100 out of a million individuals is not really bad, but then you do need to uh, collect it from multiple populations. And of course, you can stagger it over years if it's a common species, two, three, four specimens every year from two or three states is really not a big number, but that adds up. So this is something that you have to understand as an amateur or as a person who is very uh, uh, strongly in favor of conservation, uh, that extra material should not be uh, collected. That's a great thing. I don't like to collect more than I need to, but then depending on the question, you may need uh, more. So that's, uh, that's a, that, uh, that's an answer to your question. And as a person who is an amateur who may not know enough about sciences, you might ask, why do you ever need to collect 100 to know about population ecology? I'll ask you a simple thing. Do you want to conserve Sundarban tigers? Do you think they're different? They look different. They're somewhat different. Morphologically, there are some small differences. Is Javan tiger different? Do you want to conserve it? How do you know whether that's different enough? Uh, the southern and uh, uh, northern populations of, let's say, Malbar Trinim, are they distinct enough to be called different subspecies or species? You cannot just look at uh, uh, pictures or even museum specimens and decide. You will need to know, you will need to have some information on the genetic, uh, the genetic divergence between these three. So even for conservation, these, this sort of things might be useful. Another reason why you might want to collect is, for example, People are finding new species in cabinets where 100 year old specimens have been kept. People hadn't just realized that what they were looking at were different species and not just variations of a single species or not different species. Halpe, you mentioned, you talk to some of uh, these so called experts in India, they will say Halpe homolia is one species in India. Yeah, and certainly with uh, genitalia work and with sequencing work you realize that there are at least six or seven species in India in what was considered one species. And then a lot of those species turn out to be endemic. I'll say Hindu, for example, turns out to be endemic to Western Ghats. Are you then going to uh, conserve it? Are you going to give it higher conservation status? Are you going to put it in uh, uh, one of the WPA schedules? I would say you should absolutely put it in because that's an endemic species. And endemic species are more valuable for conservation than let's say something that was known to be, uh, that was believed to be common from Sri Lanka all the way to the southern China to uh, all the way deep down in Southeast Asia. Yeah, this is the sort of information that specimens can reveal. And all these years, people have thought that Halpe homolia is one species. There are people who would be their chest in India saying this is Halpe homolia, how dare you call it something else. I just showed you the evidence which is, which has been out there from 1949. With that, will you then treat it differently in conservation or even as a species? It doesn't even have to be endemic or anything else. If you think there's enough evidence to make a call in taxonomy or anything else, that is something that enriches our understanding of those species, that enriches our appreciation of those species. For example, if you use a use of a Halpe homolia here versus Northeast India versus, let's say, 
uh, in Malaysia. And you're going to say, oh, I've seen this species. You know, as a photographer, you have photographed it, you're done with it. You know? Versus there are 10 species, which is true. What was considered to be Halpe homoli are at least 10 species. So it was really a species cluster, which Evans had not understood well. And then we still have people who want to carry that on. Even if evidence has existed for the last 51 years this year, uh, 49 to 2020. So, if you are going to photograph Halpe Hindu or Halpe Molta or Halpe anything else, you're going to say, Oh, I saw something which has not been photographed before because others still don't know what they're photographing. That increases the value for a butterfly watcher, for a butterfly photographer for a conservationist and for a biologist. So um, that is why we collect and that is why it's important to uh, build you a new collection, not just go to old collection. Banded kit, there's no specimen that was collected in NSM. There's not a single specimen as far as anybody knows. In most other museums, you will not find a specimen of banded kit. It was only because Amol Patwardhan was able to photograph it. I think on the trip, Amol and uh, Jan and probably Rudra and uh, other people were there together. 2009. So they photographed it. The specimen does not exist. And only because I had known uh, museum collections that I knew that it was uh, a, a new species which was not uh, explained, uh, which was not uh, described before. If you look at around that time, again in 2014 was uh, when some specimens were seen. And again, there were people going around on Facebook saying, oh, this is red tip. It was done. I mean, there were people claiming on Facebook that red tit was seen for the first time in India. And this is, by the way, not the red tit that is known. Uh, Suvasa uh, lisiadus, that is uh, uh, red imperial. Some of uh, these people were confusing it with that with a whole bunch of things. I mean, there was it was a mess. But then people said red tit, which is uh, hypolysina, um, uh, what's the thing? It will come to me. Uh, it was that people declared on Facebook that we have discovered red tit in India. This is the first record in India. This is the range extension into India. And I knew it was not a, uh, not that. So next year we collected specimens and wrote a, a scientific paper. And now there's no doubt that this is a uh, this is a distinct species. So this is the value of having good museum collections, doing good work with uh, museum collections, and the uh, the benefits of having this sort of good reference collections are just immense. If you have seen it, if you have seen the scientific literature and what we can get from these specimens, it's amazing. I'll actually dwell on this one question a little bit more. Uh, there have been great expeditions in early 1900s or uh, mid and late 1800s where a lot of European explorers went and collected butterflies, insects, birds, whatever else uh, they were interested in. And now people are going back to those localities. They're collecting specimens once again. And now they're asking, now that the population is much smaller, now that uh, uh, the areas where the species occurs is much smaller, what are the genetic changes that have happened in these populations? And people are finding that populations have not just shrunk in number, the genetic diversity has been lost in many. And if you consider these 150 year old collections with now, the 150 year old collections have the genetic diversity locked up in these museum drawers. Now you can unlock that information and now you can uh, find out. So for example, if you find out that genetic diversity was much greater in a population earlier than now, you might think that, oh, the species is common, doesn't require any protection. But if you look at the vulnerability of that species to extinction, because it's genetically so uniform, it's much more vulnerable than something that is genetically diverse. Again, that sort of information you can get only from museum specimens. Specimens where DNA has been preserved well, like the deep frozen DNA like tissue libraries that I mentioned, that we have collected along with the new specimens that we have collected. All right, maybe the last question since it's already- Yes, 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 sir. we'll take one last question. So it's by Dr. Boj Kumar Acharya. Mm -hmm. He says, we are just starting a repository at Sikkim University. We want mm -hmm. to come and get trained in your lab. I mentioned mm -hmm. this to you when I visited your lab a year ago. 
Mm -hmm. uh, what way we can come there and spend some time getting trained? I want to come along with uh, two of the students. Mm -hmm. That will be great. Uh, but I will say that you should send me a separate email about this. There may be other people who want to do this, and ideally, there should be lots, lots of people, especially from uh, the Himalaya and Northeast India, and perhaps a few from other areas where you will need to build these resources to do a lot of work. But then given uh, the state of affairs, given how unequal the distribution of information and distribution of expertise is, we will have to collaborate. So if there are other people in the audience who want to do this, and of course, uh, Dr. Bhosh Kumar Acharya, I know personally, we have exchanged uh, uh, emails and phone calls before, but if you have not contacted me before, if you would like to collaborate with us, just drop me an email. You have my email address, it's easy to find. And then we'll uh, do this. I'm always happy to collaborate. I've never said no to anybody who has a genuine interest and who wants to do stuff. If you want to uh, uh, spend more time on nonsense like these Facebook fights, I have no interest. If you want to do anything from, let's say, natural history all the way to molecular genetics, I'm always happy. The reason I like the Nature Mates group is because these people are really, really serious about elevating uh, the understanding of uh, West Bengal butterflies, for example, or doing work anywhere else. That is the kind of work we want to do. Uh, Dr. Acharya has uh, been building a really nice group in Sikkim. Uh, we have other people, Ashok Sen Gupta. I mean, he's a, a school teacher and he has trained some very nice students. He has raised his own level of expertise uh, to a degree where as a school teacher, he is, uh, he has the kind of expertise that not many other people have. Heman Dogle, I mentioned earlier, uh, there's Rohan Pranav, who is again, just a master's student now, but he is going at a pace where he's going to be a professional at some uh, uh, point. These are the kinds of groups we need to uh, develop. These are the kinds of infrastructures, similar to what we have developed and NCBS that we need to build. So send me an email. I'll be very happy to help you uh, do all these things. Uh, as long as you have this genuine uh, desire to uh, learn and to do good stuff. I'll emphasize that there's nothing to replace good hard work. So if you're going to do that, even if I have my own research work to do, my own PhD students to train, I will spend time, I'll even spend my money and train you if you don't have the resources to do these things. And uh, uh, you're welcome to come to NCBS anytime and get trained in all these things. Uh, talk to Tarun. Tarun was, you know, in New Orleans, or how many people knew about butterflies at that time? See what he has uh, become in the last eight and a half years that he has worked with me. Really good expertise. Look at Dependra, five years, six years now, working in my lab and is producing the kind of work which is just amazing. You might have seen our recent paper on the larval morphology of uh, lilac silver line, mind blowing work. So that is the sort of work you could do. And of course, I'll be happy to come and uh, if you come, I'll be happy to train you. Yeah, so Dr. Acharya, let's continue this conversation separately. Uh, let's see how we can collaborate. And if there's anybody else, just drop me an email. Sure, okay. Thank you so much for explaining it so well. It was a long three hour. <laughs> And wonderful and informative session. I'm sure a lot of you hey, have enjoyed. Thanks a lot. Good night, everybody. Let your passion drive you. And I really hope that you will uh, get to a level, no matter whether you earn your living from this part of life, but I hope that you will get to a stage where you have contributed something wonderful to the understanding of butterflies, butterfly biology, as well as butterfly conservation. And uh, if you want to do that, all of us, uh, not just me, everybody uh, mentioned uh, through the conversation right now will be very happy to uh, help you. So uh, uh, just come together, let's form a network and we can push this framework that I just described as well as the infrastructure. So the point that Dr. Acharya mentioned was much more related to uh, infrastructure, but Dr. Acharya, you'll have to realize that infrastructure can come and go. People and their understanding and their expertise is what we really need to build. And that is uh, where I'll be even more happy to help you. Infrastructure, again, you know, government has a lot of money, states have a lot of money, and some rich universities and uh, research institutions have a lot of money. 
inspiring, convince them to build these things. But training and uh, uh, collaborations to elevate the level of work that we do, the rigor at which we do some debate work, that is where we really need to uh, start pushing things up and beyond what we have been doing. So uh, we should absolutely do that. So I hope you will read that chapter that I've been mentioning, some of the recent papers that we have published and start looking around. There is so much biology that can be uh, studied and so many interesting species uh, level things that we can discover that we can do this, yeah? All right, good night then. And let's continue with this um, uh, conversation. Sohil or uh, uh, Sharon, if yes, you sir. want to close this, please go ahead and then end the meeting. Sure, sir, I'll just end the meeting. Okay. Thank you again, sir. Thank you for the wonderful session. Thanks everyone for participating.